Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Friday of the month. Happy Canada Day to all my fellow Canadians. I hope you are living it up right now and having a beer in hand, a beaver to pet on the other side, a moose sitting in the Tim Hortons drive through getting your ice cap ready for the evening's events. Hello, welcome. Our Keith Andrews of the ET Connection tonight. Dirty Filth will be selling his cartoons Tonight, the good Edmonton boy getting a, a little bit of a surprise from Skinwalker Ranch's Brandon Fugel, who bought a plethora of the Dirty Filth art books. A plethora. Yeah, we'll get more into that with Dirty Filth later on in the first break. Let's say hello to everyone who is here so far. Race fan in the gold medal position. We have stunning Samantha Hazelwood Gray in the silver. And newcomer, Nathan Farah, taking home a bronze. Welcome to SOR Chat. And B, looking awesome tonight. Lovely Lisa Compton, John Swan. Human Carl is here, everyone. One of our favorite veterans who listens to this show. We love our veterans around here. Human Carl, thank you for your service. Daniel Berkabile, welcome to SOR Chat. Evan Walters is here. Evan will be signing autographs after the show. Line up to the right of the studio to the right of the studio. Do not make eye contact. He will not sign a thing if you do. Roy Boy, how you doing? Dutch Hank, Jurassic Joey, thanks for coming on in. Awesome Ann Palmer, good to have you here. The lovely Kathleen Hughes, the gorgeous Lara, welcome back. And who else is hanging out with us tonight? Black Dragon is here, another great veteran. This former Marine kicks ass and takes names. Thank you for your service, Black Dragon. We appreciate it. And who else is joining us tonight? Well, let's take a little look-see here. Degas, Alexis, Kyle, welcome to SOR Chat. Thank you for joining us. D. Cohen is here. Scrub-a-dub-dub is signing autographs after the show. Light up to the left of the studio, to the left of the studio. Thank you, Human Carl, for kicking off the Super Chat tonight. Very much appreciate it. The Super Chat is a wonderful way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. Michael Morris, Sausage Fingers, Wes H., good to have you all here. Hello, Holly, how you doing? Luscious Jewels, nice to see you. And the lovely and talented Susan Ahern, good to see you. Thank you for coming on in, appreciate you. And Triple Ack, how you doing, buddy? Oh, would you look at that? It's birthday boy Thomas Fessler, who is here from Disclosure tonight. Would you look at that? He, You know, he doesn't look a day over 54 years old. Doesn't look a day over 54. We love him around here. Thank you, Thomas, and happy birthday to you, my friend. And uh, gorgeous Teresa, thank you for hanging on out tonight. And who else is joining us here? Well, let's take a look, shall we? Noble Patrick has returned. The gorgeous Carol has returned as well. Sweet Donna C., how are you? Thanks for coming on in. Glenn Dannison, the gorgeous Cosmic Floor. Good to have you both here. Bobbert, nice to see you here. Well, would you look at that? A super chat on his birthday from Thomas Fessler. Thank you so much, Thomas, for your love and support of Spaced Out Radio. Dutch Hank, how you doing, buddy? Let's start the radio side. Good to have you here. And Mike Bothwell, welcome to SOR Chat once again. The gorgeous Ozzy Ange, stuck in Vegas. Good to have you here. Gong Show, Carfood Ebre, nice to have you both here. Mr. Lurks a lot. 
Thank you for joining us, Peppa H. Good to see you. And Raz, always a pleasure to have you here. Digger Dog, YJ Overlander, thanks for coming on in. The gorgeous Dizzy Me, welcome back. Eddie Rodriguez, you're looking gorgeous as well. And thank you for that super chat. I'll put it up here in a second. Doug Shelby is here. The Doug Shelby has arrived. We can officially start the show. The gorgeous Amy WC has returned. Noob Smurf, how you doing again over on Twitch? Thank you for joining us. And Michael Fontaine, TMI, thanks for joining us, guys. Uh, Aran Renze, thank you for joining us on SOR Chat. You'll take your probing with whiskey. Very nice. Very nice combination there. And who else do we have here? Well, let's take a look here. Lacey Blue, welcome to SOR Chat from Washington State. And man, we got a lot of new faces in here tonight. Knight Rider, thanks for joining us. The gorgeous Nikki from Seattle, Digger Dog, welcome. And uh, the lovely Avi May, Robert Lamoth, welcome. And my goodness, I'm not, I might Christine, horns up, everyone. of Central British Columbia to you listening around the world. This, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on Odyssey Radio, Talk Street Live, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire, check out our swag as well. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. we got a great show for you tonight. Our Keith Andrews is back to conduct the wood train down the ET Connection Highway. Then, in Hour 3, the Swamp Dweller is going to be back for another spooky story. Filling in for Tim Senor, we have our Grantavius Max on the UFO Report. Shirky Poo has the news. Each and every month, we kick things off with our Keith Andrews and the ET Connection. Keith is a lifelong ET contactee who now helps counsel those who have had their own experiences. Sure, it may seem a little weird. It may seem a little strange. But for Keith, this is everyday life. You don't have to believe it. You don't have to question it. And you don't have to, you know, understand what is going on. But the idea behind it all is people are having strange experiences. And they need people like Keith to come on in and explain to them what is happening in their extraterrestrial life. Our Keith Andrews, it's always a pleasure to have you back on Spaced Out Radio. How you doing, my friend? Not bad at all. Tried for another stroke about a week and a half, two weeks ago. I managed to bypass that one. You know, well, it's you absolutely... know, I'm just surprised that you actually got a haircut, number one. But number two that your sideburn pork chops are looking absolutely stellar tonight. Absolutely stellar. Well, I appreciate that. Now, I made it pretty clear with my other half that I'm just plain not removing the sideburns. They're, if they'll get all tidy them up periodically, but I can't put. Excellent. That's all we require. That is all we require. Now, Keith, you know, there's a lot of people out there who may be hearing you for the first time. You're a lifelong ET contactee. You're someone who now spends a lot of his time counseling those who have gone through high strangeness, shall we say. What do you like about your job in helping people understand their own contact? I think the best part of it is when I can help somebody understand that what they're going through is not an isolated situation. They're not, it doesn't really help a lot for them. You know, you still have to deal with it, but when they come to real, when they hit that realization point where they go, other people have gone through this, you know, 
that's when that's the point where you look at them and all of a sudden you feel the, the weight come off their shoulders that they're not completely losing their mind. So for a lot of people, when you deal with first time people who come up to you and state, Hey, Keith, I don't know if this is happening or not. I'm not sure if it's my imagination, but I swear the other night I saw these little humanoid beings inside my bedroom. And the next thing I know, it's six o'clock in the morning. My head is absolutely pounding. I'm not feeling good. I'm feeling a little sick and down. I mean, take us through that, Keith. Well, the first thing, the first thing I do is get them to explain what they do remember. And the moment they say, can you tell me if this was real? The fr My first issue is, I'm not going to prove it one way or the other. You've got to come and you've got to really walk through it and explain what you're going through. I can clarify what doesn't make sense, but I'm not going to fill you in on the possibilities because the danger of creating false memories by even doing something like, you know, when they say I saw somebody little, you know, little people. You don't look at them and go, well, did they have big eyes? Okay. Or were they two feet tall or, you know, could they see over the edge of your bed? You never say anything like that. It's always a question of, can you tell me anything about their facial features? Even something vague. And then I tell them, and while you're doing this, write down any detail you can think of. Because some of the most insignificant things may be the most important. Well, that's, you know, really interesting. that's interesting, Keith, because, you know, the, the fear and the confusion that a, a lot of first-time contactees have when they realize that uh, something has happened, you know, how do they first realize what's going on, in your opinion? Most often it's because they get told of something that, they don't recall. Like there's a chunk of information, a chunk of, a chunk of time that is missing, or a reaction they gave that didn't that didn't fit for anybody else, but for them seemed to be perfectly normal. Like I remember one individual I was talking to, they had an absolute panic because they were sitting in the in the living room, and all of a sudden a a um when they, they were sitting in the living room early in the evening and all of a sudden it was daylight and they didn't recognize the missing time aside from it was daylight. Somebody else came in and asked them where they had gone for the last two hours because they were all of a sudden just not in the apartment. You know, they didn't know they saw them leave. Weird. How does one know, Keith, if they have had contact, what should they look for on their body if they suspect? What are the signs? Well, the first thing you look for, and do understand these are simply indicators. They do not prove a thing on their own. But you look for a thing for marks that you don't recognize. Okay, that you don't remember being there. Things like scratches, little bumps, or little divots. Okay, or possibly a pattern. Like I remember, on one in one case, I saw the uh, I had a, a pattern that was literally the size of a meat tenderizer. Okay, and it looked like somebody hit the inside of my thigh with a meat tenderizer. Still trying to find out what that little tool was that they used. Mind you, I don't get along that well with the Talon, so they're not likely to tell me anytime soon. Well, I, I should actually tell you that a couple weeks ago. I got taken. Way to go. Yeah. And it was in a dream state where, believe it or not, the weird part about this is in this dream state, I was on a, a, I was, it was nighttime. I was standing in a, in a, on a single car driveway going into a single car carport and myself and I don't know why I dreamt about him, but Brandon Fugel, the owner of the Skinwalker Ranch, was there. And him and I were having this conversation. All of a sudden, I heard some rustling in the trees beside the carport. And I turned and looked, 
and there was a gray standing there above the bushes. I could see from just uh, below the shoulders up to the head. But here's the interesting, two interesting parts about this, Keith, that I'm curious about. Okay. Number one, it was a gray, except it had bright green eyes. Not the black almond shape. It has the almond shape eyes. And I'm going to... I'm going to mute you, Keith, because, and we're going to get to that story. I'll finish it up here because Keith is technically still on duty at his job when he does this show on Friday. So when you hear that phone ring, it does actually uh, trigger him having to take a quick call here at work. So sorry about that. But on this night, and I'll, and I'll repeat it for Keith. This isn't the first time that I have recalled being taken. Now, a lot of people will say, well, Dave, it was a dream. It was a dream. How do you know the difference between being taken in a dream and, and actually being taken? Well, the interesting part about it is how I know, for me, is the effects that happen after. And Keith, are you back? You Just are back. Minute. Yes, I am back. Okay. So what happened was I saw this little green this little gray dude with bright green eyes, much like the green we have on the screen. And right. then, then he showed me three pictures of black triangles. One at night kind of in the in the dusk, okay, where the sunlight was kind of showing the triangle. One was at night with the three dots on each corner or the dots on each corner lighting it up and then a daytime triangle, but it wasn't black. It was like metallic silver. And right after that, I could feel the gravitational pull of this gray pulling me. All right. And I kept on saying, no, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. Don't take me. I don't want to go. But the next morning, Woke up, Keith, and a number of years ago where I had the implant in the back of my head, it started killing me the next morning. So you got to tell me what went on there, buddy. Well, two main Number one, the three, the three share the, let's start with the gray itself. That I'm aware of, much like humans have multiple different races, multiple different skin colors and base and minor skeletal differences that I've seen there are at least 15 different, different, if you will, races of, of grades, different configurations. Okay, when you're dealing with, three, with, the, with the green eyes, you can bet these people are hanging around out by a riot. Okay. Have you That's seen the first. green eyes before? Yes. I have seen green eyes. I've seen your green eyed grays, your black eyed grays. They're, they're trippy people. Okay. The ones I got to kick out are the purple, the purple skinned ones. Okay. Like there's a lot of minor, of minor differences to them, but essentially they're the same. Now, I'm guessing by, by what you're describing, you're talking about that the shrubs you were talking about seeing them over top of. We're a little on the on the short side. When you said you saw the great yeah, sticking his head over yeah, the front. He, he was a tiny guy, like maybe one of the three and a half, four footers. Yeah. Now the issue of the of the three different three different um, triangle ships, not surprising the triangles, they belong to the to the authority of itself anyway. And you love this one. Well, maybe not. Remember I told you a long time ago these guys are watching what you're up to? Yes. The reason for collecting you is pretty cut and dried. They needed to make an adjustment on an outdated on an outdated um, broadcast module. Hmm. Interesting. So basically they had to replace what was in the back of my head. Essentially, yes. I went in for a tune-up is what you're saying. Pretty much. Yeah, I mean, we get them not bad reception here. They like there's a little more, a bit more up to date. Up to date for them. This is where this is before we start getting to audience questions. 
Okay. This is where for me and a lot of other people out there, Keith, who are either a skeptical or B fearful of learning and just not understanding. How does that go from a dream? Because I've never met Brandon Fugel before. Okay. Owner of Skinwalker Ranch. I have talked to him, but never made him, met him face to face. I've never shook the man's hand, never been in the same area as him ever. Right. Why would he be? Why would he be there? Because your area is not the only place they pick people up from. Quite often, the off-worlders will arrange for interconnectedness between different marked individuals on this planet. That they figure the connection can help. You know, the connection can help the the guidance and the guidance and the essential evolution of mankind without them directly interfering. You know, from everything I've gathered now, I personally have never even talked to the, to the gentleman from Skinwalker. Quite frankly, I've never actually even looked up the event. But I have met you face to face, right? And let's face it, we did not meet because of Offworld and because of an interaction Offworld. But quite often, they'll put two and two and put people together that may be able to do something. Now, from everything I've gathered from everybody that's ever said anything to me about Skinwalker Ranch, um, there's a lot going there that has a fair chunk of veracity to it. And maybe I should call it potential veracity. Interesting. I still don't get it. I still don't get it, but you know what? I'll take your word for it. Let's get to some ET uh, questions here from our audience. And if you are in our audience on YouTube or Twitter or Spreaker, put your questions for Keith in capital letters. Let's start off with YJ Overlander, a good BC boy here. Hey, R. Keith, on page one of your book, Races for the Worlds, you wrote that the Galactic Consortium uses triangle craft for atmospheric surveillance. Are there different triangles than the TR-3B? Well, not knowing what the TR-3B is, I'd have to say yes. Well, the TR-3B is said to be an American secret space program type triangle that they fly to go intergalactically. Well, I like the theory and theoretically it is possible that using one to go that they built one that will be intergalactic, but the, the, the argument against it is pretty, is pretty potent, but the off the consortium does not just use one pattern. I mean, they, there are multiple different, multiple, multiple different configurations. Okay, it's still a triangle, but the obvious one, you mentioned when you were talking about, about the three that you were showing pictures of, two were black with slightly different configuration, and then one was silver. Right. The silver one is a combat, is a combat ship. It's designed for laser reflection. Doesn't do a thing against plasma, but it works really well if somebody's using concentrated light. Okay, so how do we tell the difference between something man-made and something that would be extraterrestrially made? Well, the best way I can tell you is if you're looking at man-made, it still has a built-in exhaust system. Okay, they haven't figured out, and this is why I say the question of whether they're using it for interstellar. Uh, there's a lot of things that point against it. Whether they built it, absolutely, I don't doubt that at all. And I have no doubt it is orbital capable. But the question remains, if they have that kind of, of energy level, why, pray tell, are they still doing things completely bass backwards on the planet? All right. You know, mankind well, is, is, clearly, um, is clearly reverse engineering some of the ships that are available. But 
I mean, if they've got that kind of capability, why are they still using rocket fuels where it comes to the shuttles? They're completely outdated by about 5,000 years. That is one of the questions regarding, you know, people who are critical of the existence of the secret space program is why are we still using rockets if rockets would be highly uh, ancient, shall we say? Yes. And quite pollutive. That was not nice. <laughs> no. All right, let, let's get to some more audience questions here. This one from Raz. Dave, can you get Travis Taylor on the show? Will you ask him? We are trying as we speak, Raz, so good thinking. Let's go to Sally. She has a pair of questions. She's over in Europe. We love Sally around here. Keith, do you think they have the ability to project themselves differently, or do you think they alter our energy, which changes our perception of them? Well, that's a very that's a rather complicated question, um, but it's a good one. Number one, some of them have the capacity to alter themselves. Okay, they don't actually alter their shape for, mo for the most part. But when you take a look at the Pleiadian hybrids, these people have the capacity to alter their position, which will alter the way they look. When you're looking right at them, you may not see what's right there. Okay, now, do they have the capacity to alter your energy, which changes your perception? Technically, the answer is yes in some cases. Okay, more often than not, what they're doing is not so much altering your energy as old as using some sort of an adjustment to alter the way that you're that they appear to you by by altering their optical output. So what you physically see and or hear doesn't quite correlate. Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. All right, let's go to a follow-up from Sally, who is asking, what, which gray race, hybrids included, do you hear most about? The reticulum. The ones that are absolutely gray. You know, they, they are just gray head to foot sort of thing. Just short little people. They're, they're three and a half, four feet tall. They are the true scientists. They're also the ones that are directly involved in the hybridization program. And quite often you'll hear about them being paired up with, with Nordics. But that's an effort to help the people that they pick up cope with the fact they've been picked up. Primarily because Nordics look a lot more human than what anybody else does. Okay, so who would be the second one on that list? Of the grays? Yes. Probably your gray hybrids. There's a few of them that I know that, and no, I'm not going to give names. Number one, I don't know their names anyway. But um, gray hybrids are gray hybrids, which are the hybridized version of the, of the standard gray, if you will, of the standard Zeta reticuline. And again, they're the ones that are the most common because they're the ones that have, because they're focusing on the hybridization program, they basically have carte blanche to come in and, and take a look at what they're dealing with. They do have guidelines, so don't worry about that. Very interesting, man. Very interesting. Keith, we're going to continue with audience questions as we do every time you are on when we return from the break at the bottom of the hour. If you are in one of our chat rooms on YouTube, Spreaker, or on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio, just get a hold of us. Put your questions in capital letters. We would love for Keith to answer them and have a good time with us tonight. Our Keith Andrews of the ET Connection happens at the beginning of each month where we talk everything extraterrestrial. Keith is the commander of the SOR Wu train. This is exactly why we do it and exactly why we roll down the tracks hardcore 
into the night. Spaced Out Radio continues right after this. All right, we're clear. Okay, okay. Very cool. All right. I've got a bunch of, a few questions here. Not many, a few that are already lined up here. I figured out a way here on Spreaker to, thank you, Terry Brown, for that awesome super chat, by the way. I figured out a way on Spreaker here to actually uh, post the question so I don't have to get behind by 25, 30 minutes when you're on, which is really cool. So all I do on on uh, Streamyard here is put a is light up a little star on the question, and boom, it, it saves into a different file, and I just click on over there. It's fantastic. Oh, nice. makes makes my life yeah. a lot easier. Dirty filth, how you doing down there, buddy? Got to unmute myself. I'm doing good. It's You're funny. looking good, buddy. Thank You're you. You're looking good. I shaved today, and I even put conditioner in my chest hair to give a good body. Wow. Very interesting. Very interesting. Hey, Dirty Felt, can I claim to draw like you and draw like you do, you know, just like you do, same as I was told by, by, an, alcohol, by an alcoholic? That they quit drinking just like I did? Well, I don't know. I'm not qualified to answer that kind of question. But you can do whatever you want. I was just curious. I mean, I'm really good if I draw a stick man that fell on the stairs landing in the garburetor. I feel sorry for that stick man going in the garburetor. <laughs> <laughs> I've just drawn cartoons my entire life. And, uh, I just enjoy doing it. It's fun. Dave lets me come on here and draw cartoons, and everybody gets to enjoy it. Works out for everyone. Yeah, I can't complain too terribly much about that. I mean, the reality is, if you're enjoying it and you can make a living at it, absolutely do. I actually did one time through sales of like art and everything pay for my rent, so I consider that pretty cool. I work a normal yeah. job. I don't. I don't, I don't just get paid to draw cartoons. But one day, definitely, yeah, hopefully I get paid to draw cartoons. And I think just sit around with the cats all day and draw cartoons. And... Yeah, that's what, what I'm aiming at as far as writing goes. Because I've got, well, I don't know if it's a regular job, but I do have a, I've got a standard job. But I would love to be making enough money on my writing to uh, actually go, no, that's all I'm doing. Yeah, that'd be awesome. In all fairness, I would stop doing what I'm doing anyway, but. See, Dave needs to get spaced out radio fancy, so that all he has to do is just sit around and in his underwear and do spaced out radio through the day and then dress up all nice when the show comes on. And Are you kidding me? I'm, I'm in here in usually shorts or pajamas. You're actually wearing pants when you don't have to see the lower portion of your body, Dave. I'm kind of disappointed at you. No, I didn't. Uh, well, it all depends on <laughs> what it is in the studio, right? Well, I guess if you had guests coming over, you don't want to be totally pantsless. Damn cat hair. You're a cat hair. I'm, I probably have more cat hair than actual hair on the top of my head on my body. It's well, that's a so guarantee. <laughs> See, I was trying to cats don't, you know, cats don't shed half as much of your lacrum. Hey, hey, Keith, let's just be honest here. Have you named your sideburns yet? No. I think you should. Yeah, and everybody's welcome to into that into that thought line. But no. Come on. Yeah, the sideburns are on point, man. It's whole question in the Spaced Out Radio chat room on YouTube. Should R. Keith Andrews name his sideburns? Let's find out. Big thank you tonight to Terry, Catfish, Carl, Thomas, Sally, and Eddie for the amazing Super Chats. It's a wonderful way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. 
and we really do appreciate it. And a big, big thank you to everyone who has done some shopping at our Spaced Out Radio store recently. We really do appreciate it. And, um, yeah, <laughs> so far, Keith, the overwhelming 100% confirmation in the poll is yes, you should name your sideburns. Well, on the yep. plus side, this is one of those nice little parts where it's okay to have that kind of a poll. People have told me I should name my car, too. I never got around to that either. Cars are different. Hold on, guys. Here we go. Second half hour of Space Down Radio is now underway. Good to have you with us. My name is Dave Scott. Very much appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Space Down Radio. Do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. We continue on tonight with our Keith Andrews and the ET Connection as we are taking questions from our audience in our chat rooms, all things connected to extraterrestrial contact. And Keith, thank you so much for joining us. We very much appreciate it. And glad to be here. I cannot believe we've got to be over seven years at this point. Well, I think we are. I think we are. And, it, and you know what? Here's to another seven years, Ben. Here's I'm to another it. seven years. Let's just do it. What the hell? Let's continue on. Let's get to some audience questions here, Keith. Let's start off with Eddie. Is there a difference between vegetarians and meat eaters when it comes to the amount of people getting abducted? That depends on if it's dinner time. Um, sad to say, it's it really depends on what they're what they're doing the abduction for. You know, the, the reality is the, the vegetarians. The vegetarian um, off-worlders that, that pick people up are looking usually for different chunk of information. Okay, because they because humans are not carnivores, humans are omnivores. So the vegetarian races are still trying to figure out why they are not as aggressive as the as the off as the carnivorous off-worlders, right? And yet are still considered a threat. You know, the, the reality of it is it's not a major difference. It depends on, like, when you take a look at the at the graves, they're omnivorous. Okay, and they are simply looking at the evolutionary, at the xeno, xenoeconomic shift that's happening on, the, on this planet right now and striving to figure out how to maintain what they're up to in the advent of the human race tearing itself apart, which it's done multiple times over the years. But the vegetarians are more interested in the social structure. The carnivorous races, more often than not, are interested in the strength, in the resilience, you know, in their, as it were, combat potential. I think they, right. it's not it's not a big difference in numbers so much as in reasons. All right, let's move on to a different question here. Excuse me, as we uh, go over to Sally here. Do you think Greys are working under draconian influence? Not the way you're inferring. Greys are their own people. I mean, the draconian race, the and the the real Greys would love to be able to tell the greys what to do. Only the greys don't listen. The dra and mind you, you got to realize that the drakes, which are usually somewhere in the 13 to 15 foot mark, as far as height goes, they literally feel they should run everything. They should be in control of whatever's going on. 
but they're not interested in conquering anybody. So they constantly are putting in requests for what they should be able and what the Greys should be researching, what information should be turned over to the Greys. And they keep getting stonewalled because the consortium is of the under, is of the agreement with the Greys that the hybridization program is a good thing. And since the Drakes are not involved in even their own hybridization program, they don't require the added information. All right. All right. Let's move on here. This one comes from our man, Millennium. Which off-world or craft is your favorite to visit and why, Keith? Well, one of the more entertaining ones is the one in, oh, you said off-world. I was going to say the one leading to the to the uh, CL's home. That's actually kind of a kind of a neat little trip. Little little odd, but um, the wormhole jumpers are actually a lot of fun. But I think the best one is there's one group of people that have a black hole jumper, and that that's a rush. The Sazazians have gotten very close to it, but that was accidental on their part. But when you're talking about ships like that, you know, um, if I could get inside one, I'm taking a look in at Astrally, but the Corlock ship would be a fantastic one if you could actually get into it. The Corlock ship, if you think about it, if you saw Space Odyssey 2001, okay, like we're talking way back, right? That ship is a beautiful rendition of the Corlock ship. But there is no way any corporeal entity is going to get inside it. I've seen inside them on a, like I said, from a natural standpoint. But you can't physically enter them. All right, let's move on here, Keith. As we continue on with our Keith Andrews and the ET connection. Let's head down to downshift. So what is that audio popping noise when our Keith is speaking? Yeah, Keith, I, I'm not sure. We're getting a little bit of popping noise on your microphone. Uh, maybe try bringing it a little closer to you if you can. I'm not sure if you can. See if that can uh, it's it. a I'm, I'm waiting for, I've got a mic, a lapel mic coming right now. The only mic I've got is built right in the laptop. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to Eddie. Is there a difference with abductions when it comes to uh, vegetarian? Oh, sorry, we've already asked you that. Uh, if our if you're in our audience, just ask your question once. I will get to it. All right. John is wondering: Do aliens like your mutton chops? I've never heard any complaints about them, or for that matter, any real. The only the only race they weren't alien that had anything one way or the other to really say about it was the Dwarvish race it would be happier if I would actually grow out a full beard. But they're willing to compromise with it. All right. All right, let's move on to Blue Cruise. I have heard on some other websites, podcasts, YouTube channels, that the tall greys, six feet and up, are the leaders directing the smaller greys during abductions. Is this true? Well, aside from the fact I've run into very few of the tall greys are six feet tall, the taller greys are the controllers. They are the ones that dictate what what research program is being authorized and what the what the little greys are actually working on. But yeah, the the tall greys are definitively the, the controllers of the of the ray of the species. All right, let us Continue on here as we go to Raz. Which ET surgery event had the most credibility? I have no way of answering that. I mean, for me personally, it was when my right arm got corrected, when my right elbow got corrected. Okay, but since I don't do any research and I haven't talked to a lot of people about a lot of the surgeries that have happened, I really am not qualified to give an answer there. Well, we would love it if you did, but that's okay. 
All right, moving on here to Paradox Fossils. Do you hear the high variable frequencies when they, the extraterrestrials, are near? Sometimes. Sometimes I hear them when they're near. Um, I usually I usually don't hear the high ones. I usually hear the low ones. I tend to pick on, up on the subsonics easier. Okay, so what do you feel then when they, the extraterrestrials, are coming around? The best way I can put it is I feel a presence. And I will literally, I've been known to stop whatever I'm in the middle of. And I can be real, like, because I play D&D at the, at the dining room table, there are times when I'll be in the middle of doing something, I'll just stop, get up and walk outside and take a look. It happened a couple of months back where I just stopped and walked outside and looked at the sky. And my son came out behind me and he goes, Dad, what's up? I said, my company. He goes, oh, you're being taken tonight. And he goes back and sits down to carry on with the game. Which might give you an idea of how common an occurrence that is around here. Yes. Yes, indeed. <laughs> All right, let's move on here. Mike Bothwell is asking... Any alien abductions in the Ottawa area that you guys know of? Well, we're hoping for one to go far, far away to leave the country alone. <laughs> and, and, to take his, guess. <laughs> and, and to take his, uh, his uh, teacher-esque speak uh, uh, off this planet. No. No, I'm teasing. I'm, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. Keith, uh, abductions really happen everywhere, don't they? Yes. Quite literally, they happen everywhere from the middle of the third world countries all the way to the most densely populated parts of the, of the so-called first world countries. Hmm. It's just that people in the third world seem to accept them a little bit more readily. True. True. All right, let's go to Mike. Keith, could you talk to your alien friends to clone your sideburns? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a good, good question. They did that years ago. And if you think about it, you take a look back at the um, you take a look back at, at the original Star Trek series. Right? You remember the show Trouble with Tribbles? Active sideburns. Also, by the way, known as Icoddle. As in that is literally a, na a natural an actual race. Right. Right. All right. YJ Overlander is asking, is the alleged underwater UFO base off the coast of Malibu legit? While not knowing specifically which one they're referring you're referring to, um, I cannot say it is legit. I can tell you this: there are a number of off-world underbase, under underwater bases. Many are are set up where they enter from off there from out in the out offshore, and go underground closer to shore. Well, obviously closer to shore, but they'll hit the water out uh, offshore. And then travel underwater to get the entrance point. All right. But specifically, I don't know which one we're referring to, but I do know there are several all the way up down both the east and west coast of every continent. Excellent. All right, let's move on here, my friend. The lovely Kira is asking, is there a current temporal timeline shift? And is there an ET race that is assisting, good or bad? Well, first and foremost, the temporal timeline is not being adjusted at all from anything I've come across. We'll start there. Now, are there races that are creating complications? Certainly. But they're all in this timeline. Okay, the, the whole concept of that, that the timeline shift is built on is the concept of people traveling backwards in time. 
Now, you can get people moving forwards in time, but there's not an incident where they've come backwards. Because it just doesn't work out that way. It's a great, it's a great concept for, for, you know, for movies and what have you. It's a fantastic concept, really enjoyable to watch. But from a scientific standpoint, it doesn't work that way. So our temporal line is quite stable. The thing is, the future is not actually written, which means we still have control over what happens. But it is going to take the effort of everybody, of the majority of people working together. Okay, that's a good place for us to move on here. Let's go over to Joe, who is asking, do aliens shy away from America and fireworks on the 4th of July? <laughs> no. <laughs> I think it would attract them. That's what I was going, going to suggest. They actually, especially if you've got the, if you've got Martokians in the neighborhood, they will certainly pull closer. Okay. And it's for exactly the same reason the people that hold the star the the celebrations. It's the same reason because the stars and the starlights are incredible. Yeah, you know, the, the fireworks shows are great. Even from an off-world standpoint, they're thoroughly enjoyable. And besides that, they're easier to hide in the in the skies while there's all these flashing lights going on. They can disappear amongst them a little bit more readily and get a closer look at what people are up to. Right. 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 You know, the, the best thing I ever, one of the best things I ever seen in my life was I was flying to visit friends on the East Coast and I was flying July 3rd going into July 4th over the Eastern United States. And from the time we crossed Lake Ontario from Toronto on our connector flight, it was fireworks for the next 90 minutes looking down on my flight. And it was the most beautiful thing because we could see fireworks blowing up for miles upon miles upon miles. It was, it was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. If, if, if you ever get a chance to fly over the United States, on July 3rd or the 4th of July, I highly suggest you do it. It is absolutely gorgeous. Gorgeous. Trust me on that one. Keith, let's continue on here. we got seven minutes left before we got to go to break at the top of the hour. David Brown is asking, how many types of grays do, do you know of? At least 15. Well, 16 if you count the controllers. But we're, you're looking at at least... 15 different configurations. And yes, they are able to intermix with each other. The next part there is they are not, not actually clones. Although they are, uh, by nature, they are of reptilian, reptilian-esque descent. All right, let's move on. John Hineyosa is wondering, are all abducted people in good health, and do they abduct people who are sick? Well, in all fairness, no, all abducted people are not in good health. And whether they're sick or not is not a defining factor as far as I've ever come to understand. Sometimes they pick up ill people because it helps them understand terrestrial illness. Okay, and net result, it enables them to perfect the hybridization program and the, immu and the immune system of the hybridized versions. Okay, let us move on here. Not sure I understood that answer, but it's good enough. Michael Fontaine is asking, what is the monolith supposed to represent? No, we're going to have to go back to that one, that normal little hiccup of mine. Which monolith? Well, any monolith. What do, what do they represent? Are, are, are they representative of extraterrestrials at all? Let, let me rephrase monolith. that question. Okay, if, if we're talking about a monolith built on Earth, more often than not, they are attributed to a higher entity, not always an extraterrestrial, but a higher, a higher power. Sometimes the monoliths are used to represent, to honor certain elements. 
Okay, sometimes they are meant to honor a given event that took place, and that may or may not be of extraterrestrial or ancient race, uh, uh, or ancient race um, origin. The other thing you'll find with some monoliths, if they're only partially carved, okay, is sometimes you'll stumble across one that looks like it's only been partially carved and then stopped. Well, and I'm going to remember, well, I can actually look it up real quick this way. There is a race that is really funny. I think it's in this book. There is a, li a literal a race that they literally carve their children. Uh, where are we here? Yeah, I don't remember everything. This is why I keep writing things down. And, of Makes course, sense. I'm not going to find it. Not going to find it right off, so we own a soft copy and see if I can find it that way. There is a race that is literally, humans would call them gargoyles. Okay. But, and I just don't know if I've got this one in, in, in the first. There we go. Uh, Gargoyle, where do we find it? There we are. That's the Gorgons. Which are literally, by human standpoint, they are they are gargoyles. Because the people that set up on top of the churches and what have you, more right. often than not, they'll actually find they're actually alive. All right, let's move but on here, my friend. Let's move on here because uh, I want to get a few more questions. we got two and a half minutes. And Keith from Holly, what genre of music do the aliens most love? That is as varied as there are types of music. You know, many of them just get used to the, the simple thrum of, of starships. Okay. But when you start getting into races like the Venusians and the Angelus, you're definitely looking more along what people would classify as classified music, or as a as a classical, what humans understand as classical. Okay, it it but it really depends entirely on the individual. I'm gonna try turning your microphone down a little bit here. See if we can get rid of some of that clicking. All right, uh, Keith, let's move on here. Johnny Yuma, one, first time we've seen him in our chat room. Welcome, Johnny. Are ships living entities? I love this question. So do I. Some of them, the answer is yes. The Archons, for instance, are a race that starts off microscopic and ends up bigger than, an, than, a, than a planet. Okay. Um, but there are ships that are living entities. Most of the ships, however, are technological in nature. All right, let's move on. Uh, we got one minute left. Let's go to Marty here. Are black hole portals to other universes? Um, how do I put this? An actual black hole is a portal to a coming. You into if you can get through it, it's a portal to a coming universe or to an evolving universe. Or is more to the point, the black hole. The actual black holes are where matter gets disassembled, pulled completely apart to the subatomics, and put back together on the other side. Okay, but there's a very big difference between black hole portals. And your wormholes. Wormholes are just a transit system. All right. One quick question. 30 seconds from Glenn. Are some of the greys actually androids, maybe partly organic, but artificially created? Absolutely. But the majority of them, not. Just like humans have developed androids and robots, so did the greys. Very cool. Our Keith Andrews of the ET Connection comes in at the beginning of each month to hang out with us and tell us everything that goes on in the extraterrestrial world. Tonight, he contact, maybe some surgery talk. What do they want with our bodies? And your questions, of course. We never seem to hit our actual topic of the night. 
but you know what? That's okay. You are leading it in the chat rooms. You're leading it for our radio stations, and that's why we love our audience here on Spaced Out Radio. Keep it up as we continue on with our number two of Mighty SOR coming up next. It's funny. I'm pretty certain we never actually pick a topic anymore because it just doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. All right. Let's turn it over to Dirty Filth. We got uh, about uh, six minutes here, Keith. Six minutes. Hold off on your questions for right now, if you don't mind, because I'm just going to quickly step away. And we've got like 14 questions in the next hour for Keith. Uh, So we might uh, need a few more. I'll be right back. Yeah, there's never a topic because it's just like when you're rolling dice with your friends, especially as the guy that has to do all the campaign writing and everything. I hardly even write anything anymore because I know my players are just going to go off the rails all over the place. So, Well, you noticed that too, eh? Yeah, so I basically write like a little bit of bones to the story and I go, yeah, they'll figure it out. And it's, it's a madhouse. It's like I've got the same group or I've had the same group for, oh boy. 10 plus years now yeah my brother used to play used to run a group they sent through the dungeon and every time one of the characters died he'd leave the body as part of what they did that's pretty cool he quit he quit playing about three months ago something about he died oh well yeah that'll that'll do it no it's funny when i you know um this this is where where gaming and reality hit the hit the fan. Way back in the seventies, or way back in yeah, in the seventies, I started playing D and D. Then in the eighties, I got into aftermath, and that was a side effect. This whole series is written as I've told people. It's written by a gamer with gamers in mind. Aftermath eh? is that. D20 or do you use D6s for that? Or? No, it was D20. Okay. Aftermath. It was it was post-apocalyptic. Okay. I played some After the Bomb when I was in junior high school. That was pretty cool stuff. Palladium. Or palladium yeah. Or whatever. Yeah, Palladium is how we pronounced it anyway. Okay, good. I said Palladium. I've heard Palladium. It's just like oh, any no, fantasy right. series. Nobody can ever, like, figure out the name. It's like the Malazan books. It's, apparently, it's Malazan. I was like, nope, you wrote the books, but you're wrong. See, yeah, yeah, exactly. No, I heard somebody one day call it um, Palladium. <laughs> oh, I got to put that one down in the archives. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was just kind of looking at it going, um, can you at least spell that for me? <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh, boy. I'd actually like it. I'd like my players to play GURPS, but nobody wants to play that. It's like you say GURPS, everyone's like, what do you mean generic role playing? I don't want to play that. That's that's the fine part. The game we're playing now is a combination. Of like we we are still playing for the most part D and D second and third edition, with bits and pieces thrown in from other games. But GURPS was a, was an was an intriguing game, but it really did essentially die out. Yeah, it's it's pretty dead. You know, there aren't many of us left that There's, even heard of the game. S- similar to you, we've kind of. We originally started, I started playing 3.5 because I'm not that, I'm not like 10,000 years old like you, but, <laughs> and so my friends and I, we just kind of started with 3.5 and then we had fourth edition and we tried some other stuff and it's just kind of like, you know, once you get to that point where everything is just a mix of home rules and all that craziness. Oh yeah. And it works well, out good. Just- but, I mean, it really boils down to people just don't know. It's funny, when I went to start writing The Birth of the Wolf Pack, I started it off because I was writing, I am a gamer, right? I started writing it in a bar. I never even knew where the story was going until three, day, until three chapters before the end when I said, I'm going to have to tie this off or it's never going to stop. You know, and here I am, the next book after it, Hoping to get out for the end of the year. But my shortfall has always been marketing. Yeah, I'm not good at marketing, man. I am I just got my book published, and I don't know whether I'm supposed to just spam everything I know all over the place or what. Or as near as I can piece it together, that's about the size of it. 
you know, but see, I don't write, I write in actually five different genres. Oh. Right. I write in science fiction, science fiction, science fantasy, self help, reference, um, children's, and poetry. No westerns? Sorry, never was that much into the westerns. All right. Uh, I want to say hi to Guitar Muse for coming on in. Magneticus Attracticus. Welcome to SOR Chat. The Gorgeous Dirt Road. Welcome back. Donald Dean, welcome back. And who else do we have here joining us tonight? Um, let's see. I think we are caught up. I believe we are caught up. Well, that's a yeah, really I, I, I think that clicking sound was on my end, Keith. I think I had your microphone up too high. Oh, okay. I'm glad it was your fault, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. We've got about uh, 30 seconds. A big thank you to Human Carl, Thomas, Sally, Eddie, Catfish, and Terry. And now Marty for the awesome super chats. We really appreciate the love and support. The super chat is a wonderful way to support what we do on this um, on this show on a nightly basis. Markham, how you doing, buddy? What is happening? Where have you been hiding? You're not here enough, Markham. Hello, gorgeous Jenny. And here we go with hour number two, everybody. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Hour number two of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Dave Scott. Very much appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on Odyssey Radio, Talk Stream Live, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. All you got to do is join us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club, Jitney. Jitney is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. We continue on tonight with our good friend, R. Keith Andrews, and the ET Connection, as we are hanging on out, talking all things extraterrestrial and supernatural. Tonight, Keith, welcome back. And thank you for having me, and welcome to everybody that's joined us and is still staying with us. Now, have you ever watched the X-Files show? The original one, yes, not the newest one. All right. Downshift has a question for you about it. In that show, what is the most accurate thing that was portrayed in any of the episodes you saw? I think realistically, the skepticism of most of the so-called professionals. Like the people that were working in the government, the way they portrayed uh, pr portrayed um Mulder's, Mulder's struggle to try and get any of the information out or to get anybody to believe him. That was the most realistic of the whole of, of that was consistently realistic. All right, let's move over to Obi. Where in Southern California would be the best place to sky watch? I'd have to say outside. That's a good, good start. <laughs> Can you be a little bit more specific? Um, I assume, I think Sedona is not in, in California. Oh, no, that's in Arizona. That's in Arizona. Well, it gives you an idea how well I know geography, doesn't it? Um, but in general, in general terms, the higher up in the mountains you are and the clearer, the, the, the less artificial light that is available, the better off you are. All right. 
let's move on here to Buttman. If an alien species were to invade, do you think our elements, such as different diseases and natural elements, would wipe them out before we got wiped out? After all, we are a rare planet. That's actually a good question. That is. But the sad part is, if the any, if any of the alien species were to invade Earth, mankind would be wiped out before mankind knew it was actually under attack. So the answer would be absolutely not. The only race that I know of, that they were silly enough to actually try and invade Earth, they'd never make it because they cannot survive in Earth's atmosphere. And that would be the Pleiadians who are absolutely non-combatant. Well, let's move on here to Amy, who is asking, how do you differentiate between astral projection and abductions? Well... The astral project and projection is simply uh, is simply an issue of the individual, the individual doing the projecting, traveling wherever they will. An abduction. Now there are two things to look at. There, there is such a thing as an astral abduction, because they have the command, they have the technology. Some of these races can snag your astral body in a bio in a biomagnetic field and pull it completely away from you, still leaving it connected so the body doesn't die. But it takes your ability to move anywhere out of the equation. So it sort of depends on whether or not you yourself, the individual, is actually aware of how to ask for travel as to whether they're ever going to have any clue what's going on. Right, and that makes sense. That makes complete sense. All right, our Keith Andrews and the ET Connection continuing on here on Spaced Out Radio. Let us move over to Chris Mo in Austria. Did the ET steal the lavender back in the day because it's calming smell? Have you heard of that story from France? Honestly, no, but I can tell I haven't heard of it. But I can tell you lavender itself is for humans extremely beneficial in calming them. And therefore, it would make total sense to harvest lavender when they can get it. Because frankly, this is the only plant it grows on. But due to its calming effects on humans, it would make total sense to do so. All right. Electric Chimera, welcome to SOR Chat, is asking, do abducting aliens orchestrate people's lives? And I sh- they affect them, but they do not orchestrate them. Frankly, it is actually forbidden for them to actually orchestrate. One of the reasons that that they have mass memories put in, you know, that people get stuck with ma- with these memory masks, is to try and leave their life as stable as possible. Unfortunately, humans have a tendency of overriding the masks and remembering anyway. But they are absolutely forbidden to deliberately orchestrate. Nikki was wondering, Keith, how many clones have the ETs made of you? At what ages are those clones of you? That I'm aware of, none. They've never introduced me to them. That we have found out that that the way my that my genetics and my whole system works makes it very difficult for them to accomplish a whole lot although they have had some very direct impacts on the way my life goes but i've never heard of one that's been actually that's actually tried to clone me tried to emulate yes but they haven't managed to pull that one off very well either right Okay, let's continue on with questions for our Keith Andrews and the ET Connection. Dim to Dim is asking, do extraterrestrials know how old space and time is? Only some of them. But the answer to that question, and I cannot give you years, but if you take, you know what the big, well, let's put it this way. If you understand what the Big Bang Theory is, okay, if it, now, I grew up understanding that as a flip because of the way it was shown to me how it works. Okay, if you take a look at that, 
tying the this existence, or rather the knowledge in this existence, dates back over a billion, a billion flips. Now, I realize how big a number that sounds like. And the human brain is not designed to actually handle that kind of a calculation too terribly well. I mean, if you think about it, Earth is a very small, it's a very young planet. Okay. And it's over five and a half billion years old. Okay, but we're talking about when the Big Bang happened and everything started to expand. That's not quite the way it worked. But it does give you the idea. It's actually an ongoing process. If you think about black holes, where stuff gets pulled into them and stuff comes out the other side to be re reconfigured, okay, that is an ongoing process, much like boiling water. All right, let's move on here. Walt is wondering, out of all the millions of missing people, are the aliens eating us? Only some tiny, tiny, tiny percentage. And frankly, they're not supposed to, you know, there's very few of them that get away with it anymore. There are some that used to come, the Moldocs used to come here hunting. And then the consortium rolled into the area. Of course, the Nordics used to come and used to wander uh, wander around here, accepting the mantle of godhood. So things have certainly changed over the years. Right, right. Okay, so let's let's move on here to another question. This one comes from Super Knower. My father saw a UFO New Year's Day. Next day, family party. No one believed him until it came on the news. True story for the nineteen eighties. This still happens today, doesn't it, Keith? Yeah, quite regularly. This is why, and of course, the problem is somebody sees something like that and they're told, no, that didn't happen, forget it. Even amongst the UFO community, I find people say, no, you're imagining it, it didn't happen. And then down the road, they find out. I mean, you take a look at, uh, shoot, I'm pulling a, a friend of mine actually down in Massachusetts, I think. Just had it put out on the, and just had it proven. After 40 years, it's gone into the history books. And I'm completely pulling a blank on the guy's name, which I do apologize sincerely to him. Mm. You know, but it still happens quite consistently. I see that. Okay. Let's get to it. Let's go to Troy SR 71. If we can ever go back or forward in time, could we change the course of events or just observe them as they did or will happen? Going back in time, you can absolutely go back and look, but you can't affect it at all. Going forwards in time is a whole different ballgame. You can jump forwards in time, but the problem is you can't get back. So you're now stuck however, far, however forward you went. At that point, you can start altering the way things are going. But what you can do is scan, the, is scan the, the path of your specific life path and go, if I go down this road, what am I likely to, to cross-create? You know, what am I likely to, what's the likely outcome? By looking at that, you can absolutely change the course of, of the life you're living. But each individual has control over their own life. So all you can do is you look down the road of what somebody else is going through. Sure, you can point out where they're heading, but whether or not they believe you is a whole different ballgame. All right, let's continue on with our Keith here. Go to Christine. Do the aliens heal the sick ones who they abduct or just study them? Most of the time, they just study them. Once in a while, you'll get a scientist that goes, nope, this illness is just not working for me, so I'm going to get rid of it. But you're only looking at, and I'm being very general on this, you're only looking at approximately 25%. You've got about 25% of the, of the grades that are what you would call benevolent 
where they will step in and heal somebody's illness. You got about 25% that will sell whatever they find out to the highest bidder. And the rest of them are straight scientists. They will take you in, go, yep, you've got cancer, sucks to be you, but you're going to die. And then they will mark what's going on and watch how things evolve with that person that, that is ill and the people around them. Interesting. Very interesting. All right, Keith, let's head on over to T. Tui, who is asking, why do the Greys have to instill so much fear in people? Actually, they don't have to instill fear in people. People are naturally afraid. Okay, now people are afraid. They are taught from the get-go to fear everything, including life. So, of course, when the greys come in, and because they're of a different nature than what humans are, humans instinctively fear it right off the bat. So the reason that the greys actually, that's why the greys bring the Nordics with them now, is because Nordics are just about, they pass for humans very easily, and they help calm the people down. The, the screen memories that are used is to try and calm people down and help them adjust to the abduction itself. Hmm. Okay. So is that... I always thought it had to do with the fact, Keith, that the greys are very brittle, very weak, and... If they don't take control of a situation and knowing that humans are scared in their presence, that humans could be violent and do some damage to them. Well, that is very true. They could. But think about the rationality behind that. If, the, if humans are already afraid, is making them panicky a good idea? Well, that's what I'm saying is if you have that fear... Fear usually, I don't want to say settles you down, but I mean, they also have the power and the ability to freeze you and, and do all sorts of weird things. And that is exactly how they deal with it. But they don't actually instill the fear in people. People instill, bring the fear with them. And, they, and But you are right about the other thing you've heard. It's not so much the greys are brittle as they're a much lighter frame and therefore easily hurt. Right. All right. Well, let's continue on here on the SOR round or no, the SOR show, the ET connection. Let's go to Eddie Patch. Seriously, are there any alien races who will pay for sperm? The answer there is absolutely yes. Body parts are available from every species in every walk of life. It's no different up there. Okay. The, the reality of it is they do exist. And your, your slavery, your body part trading, all of it, and you know, and biological fluids, there is even a drug trade for, for um, brain fluid. Oh, because nice. Just, yeah, I thought you might like that. Not at all. Not at all. All right. Let's continue on here on Spaced Out Radio. The Doug Shelby is asking, you guys ever play Star Frontiers? I can't see the chat because my Wi-Fi sucks awful. So an answer I could hear would be sweet. I've never played Star Frontiers. I have. I used to play I used to play Star Star Frontiers. And, you know, it's, it's a game I haven't even, I've forgotten all about the name of it, in all fairness. It was way back in the early 80s when I played it. But, yeah, I used to run a, a medic come, come a laser, laser combat specialist. Bit of a twisted combination, but it was a lot of fun. Funny part about it is they actually got the whole idea of it correct when they start laying out some of the technologies that are used in some of the, of the primitive, of the primitive off world fight, you know, war warrior races. Yes, this world, oh, this, this world gets very twisted, Dave. You're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. oh, yes. All right. Let's go back to Kira. 
What race is part humanoid and part android? Um, no, those robots. There's a lot of them that actually use the two, but um, the ones that would be most that you would be most concerned with, and we're just going to pull this up again, just on principle, the xenon. Okay, and I've you know I didn't actually think to run that one off, but the xenon are actually a robotic race. Okay, they're not they're uh, the the Archeron. Or I guess the Arcturon would be the closest thing to it, but it's not so much that they are part, you know, part Android. It's that their technology is such that a lot of their weaponry is built into parts of their armor. So it looks like it's part of them. All right, let's continue on here. And Mike Palumbo is asking, what is the most common spots for aliens to place implants on humans? Then right at the cerebral cortex, which is right that little divot in the back of the neck at the base of the skull. In at the divot behind the ears, underneath the underneath the armpit in the lymph in the lymph nodes, or or in various locations towards the towards the um the reproductive organs. Once in a while, you'll find one put put one in the in the chest cavity near the heart, but without interfering with the actual with the actual blood flow. Okay, so which races then are using these these strange type of of oh how can we put it implants? that seem to be biological and, and they're moving throughout the skin. And when scientists or doctors try and, and get them, they move out of the way. That would be the Corlocks. The Corlocks are an amoebic race. They do not have a physical form. Basically, if you've watched Deep Space Nine and you take a look at Odo, there's a beautiful rendition of what a Corlock is. But then the, the xenons may use, the xenons could be using them. Mind you, the xenons are more likely to do something a lot worse with, a, with an implant. And yeah, they are, the xenon are actually forbidden from entering from that end. Okay. So those ones that are almost biological... Do they have their own brain, or or what triggers them to move? Um, well, you could call it their own brain. Oh, there is another one that would also be under the same category. Okay, which would be oh the the Archon or another race, and the reality of it is they aren't actually a pro a probe or a tracking unit. Okay, the ones that are moving, the Corlocks make one and make one and make ones that sense the extra the the subdermal impact the sub on a subquantum level, and are designed to escape from that contact. But the Archons will escape eventually. The Archons are literally, they it's not so much that they are a, a tracking device as they're a kid. Okay, and they're just trying to hitch a ride until they get old enough that they can get out and carry on with their own life. Right. Well, that makes sense. That makes sense. So let's see if we can sneak in one more. And the, sticking with the implants, D. Doug Shelby is asking, what are the implants actually for? They are for taking literally biological, neurological, and... Um, and subquantum information from a variety of reasons, depending on who the race was that put it in, and what they're what they're actually researching at the time. Wonderful, Keith. I'm going to get you to hold on right there. 
because we are going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. Our Keith Andrews and the ET Connection, we have until the top of the hour. We're going to take more audience questions as we continue on here on Spaced Out Radio. So just stay tuned. More intriguing comments from the Woo Train as we start our roll towards home. Spaced Out Radio with our Keith Andrews continues right after this. All right, we're clear. Okay, now I'm going to go grab coffee. You do that. Let's see what Dirty Filth is up to. Dirty Filth, what are you up to? You look like you're drawing a giant. He may be a giant. He may be a tall fellow from a Nordic region of some sort. Mm. Mm. He's got his wrestling belt on, too. I see that. You never go wrong with a little wrestling belt. You never do. You know, it's almost as powerful as a wrestling belt. Grant mm. Baker's mustache. Ooh. I was going to say some mutton chops, but... Mutton chops as well, but you never go wrong with a little Grant Baker mustache. I'm I'm happy that my pal Grant TV's Flavius Maximus of the 13th Legion is going to come hang out with us later. I know. I know. You know? By the way, children out there, Grant will give you a quarter for rubbing his bunions after a hard day of vacuuming. Who wants to earn a quarter out there? Hit up Grant Baker. I'm I'm up for that. That's like six dollars Canadian. One eight hundred Grant's mustache. <laughs> oh, it's just terrible, Dave. It is. That's horrible. That's horrible. I guess I should start trying to find. Shirky Poo's news here. This is a big drawing, Dave. That is a big drawing. Figure it's Friday, it's Canada Day. Mm -hmm. Might as well go big. People wave a flag every now and then. Got to wave a flag. You know how it goes. Yeah. All the crazies are out in Collingwood right now. I can hear them yelling over in the corner of 70th or whatever, 178th. And, ah, oh, geez, just, it's a madhouse over here, Dave. I couldn't be happier. We are back. All right, Arky. We still got to paint the gray alien, and I got to paint the reptilian. I got to paint the gnome. Holy. Well, we got some good news for tonight. Hey, good morning. It's little Johnny Davies in the UK. There he is. You Dave, know. we're going to have to go over the uh, drawing for him. Whoops. Uh -oh. Little Johnny Davies? Yeah. Why? I need a concrete idea of what we're going to do besides just like a little dragon. And... Well, know. you know you know what? You, I would almost put little Johnny Davies, because he's got about as much hair as you do, on the back of a dragon flying up to attack the UFOs. You know... I wonder if any of these, uh, wonder if any of these fighter pilots, when they went after UFOs, got that dogman Sasquatch thing, or was like, "This is a bad idea" in the back of their heads or in their minds. Wow. Gordium, good to have you here. Scotty Jensen, the with the silent J. BFG, what the hell is BFG, John? Is it a BFG nine thousand? BFG instead of dragons? Grr. 
I don't get that. English, my man. English. Big friendly giant. <sighs> Excuse me. Do you remember the friendly giant, Dave? I do. Yeah, he I do. Up way up. That was so cool. With Jerome the giraffe. What was the chicken's name? No. Oh, I forget. I wish I could remember. I remember the show. Casey. No. Casey was in Finn and no, Casey and Finnegan were. That was Mr. Dress Up. Oh, yes. That show ran from 1950. Mr. Dress Up was awesome, too. Rusty was the chicken. There you go. Rusty. Rusty was. Starting to date ourselves, eh? You know that show ran from 1958 through 1985? That's a long run. Nine seconds, guys. Hold on. Let's do this thing. the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. Good to have you with us. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you for letting us be your entertainment for the night. I remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. Here we go again, winding up the train for the final time tonight. Our Keith Andrews and the ET Connection. Sideburns are on point for Keith tonight as we're taking audience questions all night long. Keith, here we go, bud. You ready? We are ready to go. All right, let's go to Toe Tag. The ships that might be living entities, how do they communicate with the operators and other ETs? Depends on the on who they're trying to communicate with, but basically it's a combination of subharmonics and telepathy. Subharmonics to the people that, then, that are on the ship. Okay, telepathy if they've got to get off ship. Although they do use radionics on occasion if they're really in a mood for an old-fashioned method. Hmm. All right. Well, that makes sense. That makes complete sense. All right. Let's move on to another question here. This one coming from Blue Cruise. Are the aerial or atmospheric jellyfish UFOs alien spacecraft or biological entities? They are, most of them are biological entities. And if you give me five seconds, I'll even give you the information on them that I can. I just have to call it up. This is why I have the, have the uh, computer up and running for it. Because trying to keep all these straight in my own head is a royal pain. Whoop. And apparently that is, oh, that's because jellyfish is not one word the way I wrote it, I don't think. Wow, what are you doing with that, man? What well, are we are with? talking technology. What do we got here? I'm sure now the dang thing's going to seize on us. But there is a race that literally... There we go. Figment certainly no, went through it. I know I had them tracked down here somewhere. But there is a race that are literally jellyfish that are very, they look like human, like Terran jellyfish. But apparently, I'm not going to find them right now, and it would be kind of pointless to go back and forth looking for them. Okay, where do they live? Well, that sort of depends on what planet they end up on. They do require a, a, a hydrogen, not a hydrogen, but they require a high humidity, essentially Earth atmosphere, 
as in oxygen, major oxygen component in order to survive. Okay, for the most part. But okay. they are, you know, I mean, they are on a number of different planets. They just get there by, if you will, following, you know, by hitching a ride. Interesting. Very interesting. Let's move on here to another question from our audience. This one from Nucker. Do aliens yeah, like pancakes in the middle of the night? Try that again. Do aliens like eating pancakes in the middle of the night? It's all because I... I What's that? I said, depends on the alien. I would virtually guarantee reptilians don't like pancakes on the whole at all. They're pretty fond of pate, but that's another issue. By the way, um... The uh, the jellyfish race that we were talking about I haven't got all the information down, but you're dealing with the Johan. Okay. Are we good there? We are good there. All right, let's move on. Uh, so uh, to Eddie, who is asking, are the UAP a threat? Not functionally. I mean, virtually everybody will find a threat in many things. Okay. But the UAP, you know, quite frankly, they are simply, I mean, they've been around, quite frankly, longer than the, than the aerials. It was easier to stay concealed underwater than it was in the air. So they've set up entire underground, underwater bases that nobody can get to. Primarily because of, their, of the camouflage technology they use. But no, the, the thing we have to remember is the UAPs, the UFOs, or UAPs, or whatever they want to put a label on. I like the way Shakespeare put it. A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. If the UAPs were a threat, the war would be over before mankind even knew it was under attack. Because the technology they've got can create a tsunami that wipes out your entire coastal line by at least 200 miles. Not to mention the side effects. And that's just one ship. Right. Hmm. That one makes me think. How, how many ships are usually coming down at a time? I have no way of giving you that answer. I mean, you think about it, how many aircraft did mankind put in the air at the same time? Could be a Hence lot. The problem. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on here. Let's go to Chris Mo. Were humans put here or are we homemade? Okay, now, <laughs> taking the put here as in, were we brought from another planet? The answer is no. Built here, homegrown, as it were. They were, a, they were basically a genetic acceleration to handle a war that the original race couldn't handle. Humans were faster to reproduce, easier to repair, and thereby were, were, were put together with a natural with a natural aggressive streak to them. Unfortunately, humans turned that aggressive streak into a fear-based existence. So we can't entirely blame the human race for having this hidden drive to go to war. They were built for it. They weren't built as tacticians, which is obvious by the way they handle it. But no, mankind is not seeded from another world. All right, let's move on here. And let's go to Dirty Filth, who is asking, Keith, is it true reptilians prefer hand-to-hand -hand combat, and do they use flint weapons? Um, 
Number one, is it true most of them prefer hand and prefer hand-to-hand combat? The answer is definitively yes. As far as flint weapons, that's only if they absolutely have to. Okay, they are not a they are not primitive entities. Uh, Jonathan in the chat room. Yes, I blame the aliens for making you, Dave, and this guy, R. Keith Andrews. Thank you, Jonathan. Appreciate that. That's why there's much respect. Tombstone wants to know, are there alien sleeper agents here among us? Sleeper agents are a human commodity. The aliens don't bother with that kind of thinking. If they were going to attack, quite frankly, it's real simple. You wouldn't, they wouldn't be taking it out a piece at a time. It would be wholesale slaughter before you even knew about it. I talked to their, I talked to the, um, to their, to their commanding general on the consortium flagship. And he goes, look, if we want to take Earth out, if we really wanted to, we park on the other side of, of Mars and hit it with a, with a sub quantum EMP blast to knock out not only the electronics, but all of the constructed components for it. Then we'd move into the into roughly the moon's orbit and start dropping their own garbage on their heads. Mankind wouldn't have a clue what was going on until it was over. That makes sense. Not going to lie, that does make sense. Let's continue on here, T2E. Are greys responsible for animal mutilations? No. The greys never understood the concept of of butchering an animal in order to try and study a human. It didn't add up to make any sense. Okay, because from their standpoint, they're two very different critters. It would be more logical from their standpoint to butcher a chimpanzee. At least they got the same base run. Michael wants to know, what's up with Slender Man? Anything true about it? I'm only asking for my kids. <laughs> this is where I run into the problem. I really should probably look into what Slender Man is supposed to be. but I suspect I'll, I'll, that... I'll, I'll take this one, Keith. How about that? Okay. Go right Sl- ahead. Slender Man is a tulpa that if you put energy into it, he will show up. But if they don't put energy into it, he's not real. He is uh, something that was made up on the internet, and then people who were putting a lot of energy into it claim they made sightings, and this is what freaked a lot of children out, including uh, two young girls in the Midwest who decided that they were going to stab their friend because Slender Man told them to. And yeah, it, it got very, very ugly a number of years ago. But no, I'm not a believer in Slender Man, and I don't think Slender Man is real. Although there are some cryptid people out there who will disagree with me because he's become a tulpa created by our minds. So I hope I did uh, you justice there, Keith. In all fairness, it fits very much in line with the other side of it. Okay, being able to to construct something with your mind is something the human race has long ago forgotten how to do. Okay, so your explanation absolutely fits a bill of what's possible. Very true. All right, my friend, let us move on here. Pantroglodite is wondering, were those things the Russians found in the lake UFOs? I have no idea. Me either. Me either. I I think I recall that one. <clears throat> I recall hearing a story about it uh, just a uh, a few years ago. I apologize. I I don't have a better answer than that. I will look into it, Pantro. Kim Jellen is wondering why are there no clear photos of UFOs. That's the easy part. The few that do exist have been buried. But the big problem with getting them is the is the quantum magnetic field that they generate while they're moving. Makes it really difficult for today's primitive te- and primitive technology to get a fix on it. 
So what you're going to do is get a, a double or triple exposure. Due to its vibration. Exactly. All right. That's perfect answer. Let's continue on here with Vaughn. Keith, will we ever be allowed to leave this planet? We're already allowed to leave it. So the answer to that question is yes. Mankind has already been to the moon. They've got a station set up on Mars, one on EO, and another one that about 10 years ago got set up on Titan. So, yeah, mankind will be allowed to leave. They're also in the process of doing something really neat. Okay, and no, I do not have any proof for this, so we're just going to have to go with it. But mankind is currently striving to bring a plan, bring an asteroid into orbit around the moon. Okay, in order to build a, a base for building interstellar starships. But they're making one massive oversight. They've got the technology to do it. It's very primitive. They don't have the technology to do it. They're working on it. Okay, but they're making a major oversight on what that's going to do to the surface of the moon and to the surface of Earth as a, as a side effect. But that's something you can read about in 40 or 50 years. Maybe a century, depending on how quick they get their ideas on it together. All right, let's continue on here with Mr. R. Keith and go to YJ. Is there a way to ask aliens to stop erasing memory and just let the experiencer register it as is? Technically, you can ask. But due to the ramifications of letting humans actually remember everything on mass that's going on, it would absolutely decimate human society. So the odds of them actually doing it, not good. Okay. That surprises me. Why? The, um, the issue of the asking or the issue of the not telling you? Well, I, I think it's a combination of both. I well, find it dis I find it personally disrespectful. I do. Basically. Whether 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 it's good contact or bad. You know, well, I mean I can understand if they're doing something hairy that they probably don't want you to remember, that's fine. You know, but to knock you out, to take you on the ship and and uh do you know I don't know, maybe I haven't had that happen yet. I'm not sure. Here here's the problem you have to look at. Humans have been taught have been taught to fear everything, including their creator. They have been taught that anything that does not look like them is to be feared. And we've taken this to an extreme level, even on human skin color. Okay. Now, if you take the, the reality of abductions and make it absolutely unequivocal, you can now remember the whole nine yards so it doesn't feel like a dream. Okay. All of a sudden, the entire superstructure of society gets a ripple effect. And we know what happens the second that fear is brought to the surface of mankind. True. True. That would be the problem. All right, let's go to the lovely Marlena. Can I ask, what do the human Andromeda Lyran look like? Basically... Well, you think about it, they look literally like a hair suit bipedal. When we talk about a when we talk about feline, the Lyrans are some of them are are feline based, some are not. Okay, they're all actually they fall under the category of being a terrier drop. Okay. Um basically take a take a if you will, take the lion. And take a look at that facial feature and turn it a little bit more humanistic so you can actually identify it as a human. Okay. And suddenly what you've got is the, is the Andromedan Lyran. Or Lyrian, if you will. They are one of the, of the feline races that I'm aware of. But they right. they lit they literally evolved. They are carnivores, by the way. They did evolve from the from the feline from a feline base base. 
Very good. All right. Let us move on here and let us ask Paul this question. Is Mars populated? And if so, how do you think they feel about having an alien craft or our machinery roaming on their planet? <laughs> Number one, yes, it's populated. It's underground. As far as them, as far as how they feel about people exploring their planet, well, they figure it's only fair they're exploring my they're exploring Earth. You know, they've got they've got classrooms like they literally send send ships with students over here to take a look at what's going on and how humans are evolving. Primarily because they're looking at what they did and comparing it to what humans are now doing in order to show, in order to teach a by comparison their own history, not with humans, but in the way that their ancient history evolved. But they certainly don't mind mankind walking around up there, although it is an entertaining concept. People keep talking, you know, people, and Mar the, Mar the Martokians have got this information, that humans are talking about, show about colonizing Mars. And they're looking at it going, we already live here. You can't call it colonizing. It's called invading. Unless you're coming in on an amicable point, at which point you're saying I'm trading post. Which they don't have a problem with that side of it, and they're quite willing to communicate. They've already got a, tre a treaty with the Venusians. Makes sense. Makes sense. Well, all right, let's move over to T2E. Are Greys responsible for any cryptids brought here to Earth and used like guard dogs, per se? No, but the Maldocs are. Actually, you know, the Greys are responsible for a few things, but not the cryptids that I'm aware of. Many of the cryptids actually evolved here, and people just haven't proven it. Okay, but the Maldocs are absolutely responsible for bringing cryptids here. Quite by accident, but, you know, what the heck. Not the least of which is, uh, what the heck is it? Little Mexican guy. Speedy Little Mexican guy. The witch? Speedy Gonzalez? Uh, El, no. Ov El Ovni Volador? Don't know him. Me either. He's a jerk. I don't what the heck it was. There, there's a cryptid running around. They also know it as a guy. Ch no, Ch Ch Chupacabra? Thank you. All right. That was that was an accident of the Maldogs. I believe, anyway. All right. Let's go on to Jonathan in the UK as we got two minutes left with you, Keith. Can we blame the aliens for the flies and the seagulls stealing my chips? <laughs> well, you can blame who you'd like, but the flies and the seagulls evolved here. I hear you. All right. One final question from Jenny. Keith, CERN restarts July 5th. Should we be worried? Personally, I can't see the point in worrying. But um, they're all that CERN, you know, from what I understand about CERN, it's not actually having as big an impact as what they're hoping it will, which is probably a good thing. Yeah, you know, but there's not much point. This is one of those things that what you worry about is not CERN, but the people that are actually controlling it and actually guiding its actions. That's where the complication comes in. Please tell everybody in one minute where they can find all of your books and your information. The information is the easy part. On YouTube, look up R. Keith Andrews specifically the journey below that you'll find all sorts of ways of connecting me of, of connecting with me and a list of all the books i've got in in print that you can get straight through me okay and if you're looking for a face look me up on facebook also under inner voice enterprises or on under ilderbach i've got you know i'm not too hard to find of course if dave doesn't mind contact him he can put you right in touch with me in a hurry it's happened before. It's happened before. Very much, and thankfully so. 
Oh, we appreciate it, man. We appreciate your time, our Keith Andrews. Thank you for another wonderful edition of the ET Connection. We'll talk to you next month, my man. Absolutely. You take care, Dave. And thanks so much to everybody for joining us. All right. Our Keith Andrews and the ET Connection. When we return, we're going to head to the swamp. Our resident swamp dweller is going to tell us another spooky story. Then the mustache wonder Grant Baker filling in for Tim Senor on the UFO Report. We continue with Space Down Radio right after this. Good job, R. Keith. Thank you so much. Much love, my friend. We'll talk to you uh, very soon, okay? Absolutely. You have a good one. All right, dude. Take care. R. Keith Andrews, everyone. And I'll be right back. Dirty filth. It's all yours, brother. All yours. <clears throat> it's all mine. I hope everybody's having a great time. I'm into my favorite part of it all. Inking everything so that it all looks nice. And all the curious people can finally be like, hey, what the heck was he drawing all night? It's the party at R. Keith Andrews' house. It's right enough. I'm just a slob with the water, so that's why I, I gotta I need to get like a hair dryer or something. I don't have hair, so. Probably, probably a good investment. Just imagine myself going to the local store and buying a blow dryer, and they'd be like, "Sir, you don't even have hair." We'd be like, "Yep, it's for art stuff." And they'd be like, "Well, he's makes sense. Look at him." But anyways, working on it's it's Dave and Eric Keith Andrews. I drew his magnificent mutton chops in there. We'll get to those soon enough. I have to get the speech balloons in. I have to figure out what two colors are Keith Andrews like, so the next time I draw them, I can... Oh, you stupid thing. Oh, I apologize. I'll have to ask R. Keith Andrews for what his two favorite colors are, so the next time I draw a cartoon of him I can put them in there otherwise he's just using my basic Cuban color of gray border and blue background Dave's just having some more derbs well Kira I I, I like drawing the big ones like one sheet bastards pardon my french as opposed to the smaller ones because it can get a little more detail it just takes a little bit longer that's the that's the only thing so it's all good there's david his magnificent beard look at him it's a little unkept in this drawing though that's canada dries People are firing off fireworks outside. Hospitals in Canada are going to be filled with people with missing fingers. You're like, oh, bloody hells. How did you manage this? To be like, I don't know. I was holding a Roman candle and it just blew up my hands. I knew a guy that blew off some of his fingers. Sucker. But I guess uh, he wasn't even a sapper or anything. Like those Malazan sappers, that's the best. That's what I'm thinking about now. Here we go. David's little tree of snacks. Arky Andrew's place. The parting down. All the snacks are little triangle shaped UFOs of chocolate. I'm not sure if they if the chocolate has any filling on the inside or not because i've never been to one of the parties it's just what i heard it's a caramel but my 
absolute favorite candy bar in the entire universe is a payday. That's that's the best stuff. You can't get them in Canada very often. You got to go to like specialty places. So then I went to Vegas. Went down to the little kiosk thing, and there were some paydays there, and lots of paydays. It was delicious. Actually, no, I didn't. I passed on it. I was going to go back. They actually ID'd me, which was hilarious. And I was like, oh, i got to go with my ID. I'll be right back. And then I didn't end up going back, so screw that. And How are you doing there, Dirty Filth? I was just telling everybody about when we were in Vegas, and I went to buy uh, some adult beverages, and uh, they ID'd me. And I was going to get some paydays, my favorite chocolate bars, candy bar, rather. And they ID'd me. The lady's like, ID. I'm like, what? She's like, ID. And I was like, what? She's ID for the beers. And I was like, oh, okay. And then uh, I was like, well, I don't have it. So I, I was going to go back. But I never did. Well, I got sidetracked having to get go on Spaced Out Radio. And I hear you, buddy. Sweating myself. And it was live. And oh, boy. That was I hear cool. you. It happens. I, I it happens. It peer pressure pretty quick. Yeah. I like it. Look at those chops on our Keith Andrews. Holy Aren't those dude. beautiful? Dude, those chops are massive. And there's Dave. He's got his little chocolate pyramid snacks. Love it. Love it. All right. Uh, well, thank you to Cat Chaser, Catfish, Carl, Terry, Thomas, Marty, Sally, Eddie, Eddie, and Vaughn for the super chats. Here we go with hour number three, everyone. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. Good to have you with us. My name is Dave Scott. Very much appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on Odyssey Radio, TalkStream Live, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Jitney. Jitney is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. For the final time, here we go. Just tonight, that is. And let's get to the swamp. Let's go to the swamp dweller, shall we? Hi, Spaced Out Radio listeners. This is Swamp Dweller. It's time for your nightly dose of spookiness on the show. If you have an interesting encounter or a spooky story that you would like to share, be sure to submit them in at swampdweller.net. You can also find our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash swampdwellerreads. Now, let's chill out, relax, and together, let's enter the swamp. I live in eastern Finland, in a small city. Most of the cities here are like openings or holes in a forest. If you look at them down from the sky, in the Finnish folklore, there are many stories of forest creatures and spirits that guard the forest and lead people astray. There are even stories of forest shrouding a person so that he or she gets lost in it for years. That there is an upside down world, and that where all kinds of wondrous and scary ancient things live. There are stories of a lot of people going into the forest shroud and making it out years later with odd stories to tell. There's this birch forest near my home. A black river streams through it, and it floods in the spring. I usually walk the dog in there because I think it's beautiful. Birch tree forests aren't that common over here, and the trees are old. 
Some of them are huge, old, and full of fungi and twisted. Sometimes I take the kids there too. My daughter is very sensitive in a way. From an early age, she's been seeing and talking to imaginary things. Some of them which were odd. For example, my now dead grandmother. My daughter, she never met her, but often talked about her. One day, when we were eating out for dinner, she just stood up, looked out the window, and burst into tears and cried. Goodbye, Mama. That was the end of the imaginary friend that we thought was my grandmother. It's curious, because I think my daughter kind of reminds me of her, too. One time, during the day when we were walking among the birch woods, my daughter said that there was somebody there. A dead horse named Lotta. She told me that it was a very old horse and it lived there. I laughed to her. I'm just used to these kind of stories from her. I smile, shrug, and laugh at them. But there's always this weird undertone to them. Stories are fantastic and imaginative, but eerily consistent. Like an unconscious hint of a memory. I think she's just a smart child with a good imagination. But when she cries at night, and I walk into the room... I find her sleepwalking and pointing at an empty chair in the middle of the room with her tiny index finger. It feels uncanny, like there's something between the lines. A couple of months ago, it was a full moon and I was walking my dog at night. I was going for a walk in the birch forest. The moon painted the frost bluish. As I approached the forest, the birch trees rose from the frozen ground like these white upside down runs, and behind them, just black with hints of more white sides on the trees. It must have been like a hundred meters away when I heard something from the dark forest. Something heavy was moving around there, crashing away in the forest. Sometimes, I've heard the rabbits scream in there when a lynx or a fox gets them. The rabbits scream like a small child when they are dying, but this was something different. A wild boar, maybe a moose. The dog was also interested in the sounds. Its ears pointed upwards. We walked closer to the white trees and the noises got louder. We both stopped to look. The dog didn't bark. It just pointed its nose towards the sound. We were like 20 meters away from the tree line when the sound stopped. For a while, it was just quiet. Then it started again. Something started running in the forest, near the tree line. Not from us, but toward us. It gives me chills just remembering this. Heavy, amazingly fast steps. I started to think it was a bipedal according to the sounds it made. 20 to 30 meters in, it made only a couple of sounds. In the pitch black and on uneven forest ground, somehow it was making up so much ground without tripping or anything. Between the trunks and over fallen trees and bushes. It's not a human being. It's not a moose, I remember thinking. My dog's head accordingly turned to the movement. And then it stopped. Right before us, I felt the darkness staring at me and I stared back. For sure I wasn't going in the forest with my dog, but something dark was facing us. Just to the left of the path, I was going to walk to enter the forest. It was making sounds in front of us. I started on my way back from the tree line still facing the woods and the sounds. Whatever was in there, it was very interested in us, but I didn't seem to want to come out of the forest. I wasn't going to turn my back to it, that's for sure. My hands curled into fists. The dog had his tail between his legs as we backed away. The sounds continued. I could hear them even from over 100 meters away. It was then that I turned my back on it and started walking away. I walked fast, thinking all the possible forms of the darkness could have just been anything and maybe it was my imagination playing on me. The terror I felt was real. I rushed to my home and locked the door. Even my wife got nervous seeing me spook like that. I've been in the forest almost every night since then, walking the dog, and I've never seen anything or heard anything since. But I've always been on alert since that night, wondering if not knowing what that was might be hazardous. I've never seen or heard anything since that night, and I've never heard or seen anything move so fast through the woods before, but then I think about the dead horse my daughter said she saw. I know little children see things, but I also know their interpretations of things might be off. 
they see more than us adults who have learned to see the world around us in a certain way, but therefore lacking the ability to describe it. Maybe she didn't see a dead horse at all, but something that she couldn't describe in any other way. You know what? You always got to check out the children. Listen to the children, especially them youngsters. They see some weird stuff. Pay attention if you're a parent, because you never know what the youngsters may see that's following them. Thank you to the Swamp Dweller for coming on in and freaking us out. Once again, head on over to his YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Swamp Dweller Reads, and check out all his great stories. He's got thousands of them. Make sure you hit subscribe. Here we go with the UFO report. Nobody's going to know. They're going to know. You're going to know. Filling in for the lovely and talented Tim Senor, who is away sick again today. He's hoping to be back for the next one. And, you know, it's always fun talking to UFOs at any time of the night. And it's always fun to stare at Grant Baker's mustache, which is always on point and on par. Grant, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing pretty good. Thank you. How you doing, my man? I am doing wonderful, and it's a nice uh, nice time around the studio. It's always good to have our Keith Andrews in the house here and mm-hmm. chat away, weirding everybody out. I know there's people who love him. I know there's people who are like, this guy's got to be nuts. But I tell you, he's one of our most popular shows over the years, and we just keep on letting them roll that woo train down the tracks, man. Absolutely. And you know what's great about him is when you ask him a question, he is on point. He can answer him with a blink of an eye. He just does not hesitate. And I love that about him. Yeah. And and you know what else I love about him is he's not affected by the media. Oh, okay. Yeah. He's not on UFO Twitter. He's not keeping up with what Skinwalker Ranch is ha- is going on. He's not, you know, following all the government aspects of everything. He's just doing his own thing and what his own experiences and the experiences of others have led him to believe. And I think it's very, it's, it's childlike. And I mean that very complimentary and I think it's wonderful. I really do. Yep. Yep. I got to agree with you. All right. Let's get to it on the UFO report tonight because there's some big stories coming out, including Like, this one blows me away, my man. Uh, I want to start with this story that uh, John Greenwald from the Black Vault came out with because there's been a lot of criticism recently about Travis Taylor. Mm -hmm. And there's one journalist who's quite the skeptic. His name is Keith Kluwer, who apparently may have held back on a story about Travis Taylor just to make him look bad. Mm -hmm. What's going on here, man? Well, I mean, according to the article, he, he wanted to paint a little bit of a different picture. It was more kind of a, of just a minor word change is what it seems like. And we just actually talked about Travis just the other night. And it's one of those pieces where, the story was kind of misquoted and there was an actual email back and forth from the journalist that wrote this particular story to Susan Goff. Is that correct? Susan Goff. Correct. Is that okay? And she even read the story and it's like, no, that, that is a misquote. It, it, they didn't quite use it correctly. And it just, unfortunately some of these things happen. It's, you know, you get Clore, who's writing for Science Magazine, and he was trying to convey and, and make it seem like Travis Taylor was not quite telling the truth and saying, you know, I don't know if Travis actually said he was the lead engineer. But there's other articles that say he did. But in this particular case, you know, it, it was his role on the UAP task force, and they they seemingly disregarded the claim of his you know, quote, quote, unquote, chief science uh, or scientist uh, of that project. 
See, one of the things that, Grant, that I kind of question as a journalist myself is we make mistakes. Mm -hmm. We do. We're all, we're all okay. human. We're all human. We do make mistakes. However, we also know this is a gentleman in Keith Kluwer who has made it his daily target to go after whoever is stepping forward to bring UFO information. Mm -hmm. He has gone hard over Luis Elizondo. He has gone hard on Chris uh, Mellon. He has mm -hmm. gone hard on Harry Reid and other researchers, whether they deserve it or not. Jeremy Corbell comes to mind when I, when I think about this. And yet, Travis Taylor, this is an anomaly for me, man an absolute anomaly for me because I don't know if he's doing the right thing. I'm not questioning his, his education. The guy is brilliant. I mean, he's got two master's degrees, uh, a doctorate. He's got, I think, uh, two bachelor's degrees, all in different subjects. This guy is, you know, a brain and a very, very intelligent man. He's also starred on television shows recently, Skinwalker Ranch. He was recently in the documentary, Tear in the Sky. He's been on Ancient Aliens. And all this time, we had no idea that he was playing the government card. Mm -hmm. and we always talk about ufology being in, in how, what's the word I'm looking for? Indoctrinated by government and intelligence officials. Well, now we know their scientists are involved deeply as well. But I think with him, there is almost honor among thieves because he does seem to really want to be a, a voice in this community. He's passionate about it. He is someone who speaks well of this topic. Mm -hmm. All right. And he loves, you know, let's face it. For all of us who have interest in ufology, he has the greatest job in the world. Yeah. <laughs> he's got, yeah, he does. He's got the job at Skinwalker Ranch. He's a good looking guy. That's why he gets all the TV time. And he's the top woo scientist for the government or one of them. Yeah. So I, I, I find myself being a little imbalanced, but, but when it comes to Keith Kluwer and others like him, they are literally going after every small tidbit of information and hammering people on it. And I don't think that's proper journalism. I don't think it's ethical. Yeah. Tell me the story with the facts, not your facts, Keith Kluwer, but the facts that go along with it. And if the facts prove that he is a shill and maybe misleading us down, well, then we as a UFO community have to do something about it. Yep. But if right. he's not, give the guy his due. So I agree tell wholeheartedly. Me, tell me more what's going on in this story. So, I mean, you got to understand when it comes to, you know, Taylor, he worked for the U.S. Army Space and Missile Defense Command. So, like the guy, just like you said, he was, he was credentialed. And when you have Susan Guff that says, you know, he was a federal employee. Uh, he wasn't hired for the UAPTF. I mean, he, but he participated in it. And at the time, there was a, a part in the article that I'd read that they just referred to him as the chief scientist as they were trying to assemble, you know, a larger team. They were trying to bring more people in. Uh, it was not a full-time assignment. But, I mean, even, even coming from, you know, the Pentagon and stuff like that, when you have somebody else, it's like, hey, you know, he was considered the informal chief. And this guy is just trying to batter him down. It's like, come on, man, you know, give the guy a break. And this is coming from the the Pentagon. This is coming from sources that are like, no, that wasn't entirely true. And it's, it's just, it's one of those things. I mean, the real, the real quote, uh, that science magazine did not want was and i'm gonna to have to read it out to you is the uaptf leadership and how they referred to dr taylor it, it, the reference of the site the chief scientist title is informal that's that's where the whole q 
changing of exactly what it says and what it should say. Just that one word alone is what changed everything for him. But it is a misquote. And I don't think it was an honest mistake. I think it was something that was purposely done and purposely trying to tear the man's credibility down. John Greenwald, I want to read a part of this for our audience. He says, if you don't know anything about the journalist who wrote this piece, Keith Kluwer often ridicules and writes negative pieces about the UFO topic. His social media interactions often get aggressive and nasty. And there is a clear indication that no matter what evidence is presented about UFOs, Kluwer will ridicule it and belittle those that research it. Now, as I am sure Clear will read this, I will almost bet money that he is right now rapidly sifting through his emails to find where I paid him a compliment in the past so he can fire back at me about what I just wrote above. I did compliment him. In fact, Kluwer tweets about that compliment, so I'm sure he will again. Truth be told, years ago, I thought Kluwer had good intentions with reporting, and I told him as such at the time. I was wrong. And I think somebody like John Greenwald, who, you know, he is his own controversial uh, man with the black vault at times, and he has gone hard on people and he has uh, questioned people's in- integrity regarding this as his integrity has been questioned as well. But the way Clure has been where nothing is ever going to satisfy him. You know, the president of the United States could, could allow him to meet Ock the gray. And he will say it's a man in a bodysuit. He'll be pulling the face, trying to rip off the mask like Shaggy and Scooby and Daphne and Velma and Fred to see who the culprit is. And there it goes. But we have a number of, of journalists like that who are here to just rip apart this topic. Stephen Greenstreet over the last six, eight months from the New York Post has been doing this. You know, there's Keith Kluwer. There's other podcasts out there that are just, you know, out there to rip new buttholes to absolutely everyone they can for and, and for any work that they've done. So, I mean, when we look at it, it doesn't provide for a real healthy situation. Correct. I mean, when you're on the UFO topic, everything has to have accuracy. In order for anybody to take it seriously, these little quibbles have got to quit. And I'm not going to down, you know, Science Magazine and all that jazz. But, I mean, realistically, if you're going to be in journalism and write about this, don't don't lead the nar- you know, the narrative your own way or how you want your headline to be blasted out on your, your website or your magazine. You don't want to say, hey, this is what we think, and then completely bypass all the information and everything that was given to us by the Pentagon or the DOD and just completely make your own narrative. It just doesn't make sense. And it's 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 not good for you know the UFO community. It doesn't look good for them, especially even the redaction that they did, or I think that they had done a error fix. And even that wasn't quite right. I mean they had said that were you know that he'd work for it and it was an error that they said informally referred to as the chief scientist. So it's it's one of those deals that they didn't even fix it when they tried to fix it. So it's the, their correction was not much of a correction. Very true. Very true. We got one minute on this subject. I would suggest that this this is only the start of the media war between the Black Vault and um and uh, Keith Clore, the journalist, apparently here's some omitted points that Clore missed, that Dr. Taylor's work was sanctioned by the U.S. Army and Space and Missile Command. His expertise was offered to the UAP task force on a time-limited basis, that his input was only a part of a larger number of contributing organizations across the DOD, the intelligence community, and other parts of the federal government to assist with a formal stand-up of the UAPTF and its reporting requirements. I mean, there's a lot of information just in there that we're going to have to watch out for. And we have Grant Baker in tonight on the UFO report filling in for Tim Senor, who is ailing tonight. And coming up next, uh, Grant, we're going to get into unknown drones or UFOs. 
harassing warships of the United States Navy, the most powerful force on the planet? Wow. This one's going to be good, Grant. This one's going to be good, and I cannot wait to get into it. Grant Baker on the UFO Report. Filling in for Tim Senor. We're having a hell of a show here on Spaced Out Radio. We continue on the final half hour right after this. Stay tuned. All right. The Grantavius Maximus. Grantavius Maximus. Who now owes Filthy a whole box of paydays. Yeah, I'll take your full box of paydays, man. <laughs> you got it, my man. Oh, my goodness. That's right. Look at this uh, party at our Keith Andrews house so far. Beautiful. Apparently, according to Evan, it is a SOR conspiracy to promote mustaches and beard trimmers. <laughs> I use I use a beard trimmer on my mustache all the time. And Kira thinks you're a dream boat there, Mr. Grantavius. Oh, oh boy. Boy. Ooh, Kira. I'm going to see her next week, actually. I'm going to ride oh, my motorcycle down yeah. in Shasta. Well, you have to tell her I say hi then. I will definitely do yeah. so. She's an awesome lady, I can tell you that. We much. love we love Kira around here. She gives the greatest hugs. Gives the greatest hugs. When she hugs you, you literally know that she is hugging because she cares about you. Yep. It's awesome. She's tall too. She's at least six foot eight. <laughs> I sit on my tippy toes when I talk to her, so I could be at like chin level. Mm-hmm. Me too. Mm-hmm. Triple Ack. It is true. I just escaped from the SOR lab. You won't believe what's going on in there. They are, they are, oh my God, feed got cut. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're pretty he's not with wrong. The, uh, we're pretty quick with dealing with the strays. I escape. <laughs> escape, not escape. I apologize. Look at this. You, you have another fan here. Dizzy me saying, I think Grant is one of my favorites to listen to. No, oh, thank you so much. Oh, listen to this. Listen to this bullshit here. <laughs> I'm not as good looking as Dave, but I mean, hey, oh, right. no, no, you're way hotter than me. You know who's hot? The hottest one, and he's not even on here, is Sexy Dan. Oh, yeah. Sexy Dan is gorgeous. Good old Sexy Dan. Yeah, hey, Sexy Dan. Hey. Sexy Dan is so gorgeous, he can even survive helicopter crashes without a scratch. Without a scratch. <laughs> and that's a true story right there. Yeah, he, he did pretty good in that one. I told him, don't go, next time you go bungee jumping, don't take the helicopter with you. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, Here's 511. Here's yeah. five eleven. Yeah, she's she's taller than all of us. Yeah, she is. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Oh, uh, triple triple X got a crush on you too. Grant has that Clark Kent cuteness going on though. You just wait until I shave and grow my hair out and do the whole curly cue and put on my Superman costume. Done. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Oh, man, I can't wait to talk about these drones. Me either, man. Me either. Okay, Gordon Lightfoot is trending in Canada. You better still be with us because I love Gordon Lightfoot. Yeah, I always get scared when he trends. Because he's like 80-some years old now. I'm going to do some art cards in this last little bit here. I want to see the full one here. I haven't. Uh, let me pull it up here. Hold on. Uh, 
par AK, a uh, party with our Keith Anders. This is a great party. By the way, Carl stole your truck. Oh, damn it. And there's uh, the aliens there. Odin Raslin. Very nice, dirty filth. <laughs> Very nice. Look at those pork chops on our Keith. You know what the sad part is? You didn't even overemphasize them. No, I, I was going as accurate as possible. And he's got his bookshelf of RPG books, too, by the way. Yes. Yes. That is amazing. You get a gray Absolutely. alien, a reptilian there, and the gnome. Uh huh. Got a lot. I can't even. I couldn't even draw the top of the tall Nordic's head. I mean, unbelievable. It's just I hear tall, you. Dave. I know. I know. All right. A big thank you to Human Carl, Thomas, Sally, Eddie, Catfish, Terry, Marty, Eddie again, Vaughn, and Cat Chaser for the amazing super chats tonight. It's a wonderful way to, to uh, support this show. Give us a thumbs up, thumbs down, and after the show, leave a comment below because it really helps with our algorithms, if you don't mind. And here we go with the final half hour. Oh. We rounded third. We're headed for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate it. I want to remind you that if you missed most of this show or others, check out our free archives, youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot, reading Shirky Poo's Newswire, and checking out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram, at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok, at Spaced Out Radio. For the final time tonight, we introduce Grant Baker. He is here filling in for Tim Senor on the UFO Report, hanging on out, and we are going to get into a real interesting story here where people are questioning hundreds of drones or dozens of drones flying around United States Navy warships. Grant, take it away. So this is one of the things about the drones, and I'm using my hands for anybody that can't see me, quote, unquote, drones. So the, the Department of Defense, uh, the actual undersecretary, Ronald Moultrie, he says that they're going to apply rigorous scientific analysis to figure out what these things are. Now, the biggest question about it is they're pretty comfortable with calling these things drones, but they're really not looking into the biggest issue of it all is where did these things come from? Where do they, what's the origin of these so-called quote unquote drones? I mean, even the, even the Pentagon has confirmed that they're there, but they don't know where they're coming from. And that's the, that's the biggest thing of all these things are being placed in you know way out in the middle of the ocean they're buzzing these ships sometimes like last or the night before last i was talking about how they're they're getting really close to these ships now drones have a, an inherent problem they are either run off gasoline powered or battery power gasoline you can hear so you have a little engine on there and you can hear them the problem with the battery power one is is flight range they can only go at max and these are probably some of the most technically advanced drones that we do have and do know about about seven miles some of these things are sitting about four miles above these ships and then they come down and they swarm them and do all this weird maneuvering the issue with drones and battery technology that we have today is you would have to have a ship within six miles of the one that you're you know targeting which means any of these military ships are like, oh, these are drones. Where are they coming from? They can't come off the coast. It's too far away. They had another ship that was out there called the Bass Strait, and they were like, oh, they checked that ship out. They didn't have any drone technology on that ship. They sent that to port, and they were still happening. So realistically, the biggest question is where are they coming from? Where's the origin of these? They have no idea. These Navy, you know, U.S. Navy ships, they're operating off the west coast of the United States. This has been in July of 19. 
I mean, they're calling them unmanned aerial systems, which is UAS. And they're operating within their airspace in their operations areas. These And they have no idea where they're coming from. They have no idea who's pilot piloting these. You know, they're trying to figure it out because you have counterterrorism, counterintelligence, you know, all these subcommittees and everything else that are trying to figure this out because it, a lot of people are like, well, if it's not Russia, China, or anybody else, or let's just say it is, we're in trouble because if they have technology that can, if let's say they are drones for lack of a better illustration, let's say they are drones and somebody, some kid over in China decided to build this really cool thing that he made and goes out there with it. And it's, and it's exhibiting all these crazy 90 degree maneuvers. There's obviously a lot of the uh, crew members that are on these ships are saying, no, these aren't drones. These things are doing something completely different. You see where I'm going with that? It's one of those deals where I do. And, and, you know, the idea that they've tried to shoot them down and it hasn't worked yet. Mm -mm. I don't think a human made drone could really outrun or outmaneuver a Mach four sidewinder missile. (laughs) No heat seeking missile. I just don't see that happening. So comedically speaking, there is actually, if anybody wants to go out there and find it, I think it's on YouTube somewhere. There is actually a gorilla that caught a drone with his bare hands and was looking into the camera. So, I mean, it, and they, the DOD, or I mean, not the DOD, the warships that are out there, there has been people that, you know, that go out there. Oh, what are they? Poachers. Poachers have shot down drones because they don't want to be caught poaching. So people that are just sitting on the ground with their, rifles can shoot these things out of the air there's one guy that was throwing rocks at one and got a drone out of the air if a monkey can grab one straight out of the sky and look into the camera why in the world can our most you know awesome warships that are out there with the sea whiz and anybody that wants to look up the sea whiz it's close in weapon system those things are amazing they calibrate those probably on a daily basis the Sea Whiz can shoot rockets straight out of the sky. They can shoot a duck out of the water from a mile. I mean, they're amazing systems. And you can't shoot a so-called quote-unquote drone out of the sky? Give me a break. You know, you know, Jonathan has it right in our chat room. He says, we need to stop using the word drones and start calling them UFOs again until unide- or until identified. I agree with this. I mean, mm-hmm. it just seems like we're going backwards on the identification of this we know that something from seven miles out that can get to sea level in less than a second is not a drone nope you, you not know even we, in the slightest we know this we've seen it happen it's been recorded and add to the fact that if if these uap ufos drones whatever you feel comfortable in calling them are harassing these warships why aren't they doing anything about them exactly and not on top of that you know you're talking about the department of defense they're classifying these things as drones yet they have documented footage like literal footage of these things going from eighty thousand feet to three or ten feet above sea level in seven eighths or even less than a second and not not only that, but they're going from space, air, and down into the water. So you have transmitting maneuverability with these things. We do not have that type of technology. It is not it now. Granted, it could be a drone from somebody else in the universe that's controlling it, but it's definitely not a drone. I well, agree Tony, with him completely. Tony brings in a good point here. He goes, surely if unidentified drones are buzzing the military, it's an act of war. Good and thing. if it was China or if it was Russia or any other American adversary doing this in American airspace, there would be hell to pay. There, you know, it would be all over the mainstream media that Russia or China has these military drones that are hovering over naval ships. The American government would be all hoity toity about putting sanctions on these countries for invading uh airspace or restricted airspace 
you know, and they know that they would have a little bit of egg on their face for the most powerful Navy in the world having this happen to them. But we know it's not just the Navy. We know it's the United States Air Force as well who are refusing to talk about it, Grant. Oh, you're you're not kidding. The Air Force is keeping a tight lid on what they know. And, you know, the Navy's not being full forthcoming about it either. Just like he said, if they're buzzing the military, you know, warships that are out there, that is an act of war. But let's 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 talk about the five observables when you see a UFO. Here's the five things. So this is probably what is scaring them because they do not have control over their own airspace. Number one is anti-gravity. You know, this means that it travels without any kind of means of propulsion to it or lift. There's no exhaust, nothing. Then you have instantaneous acceleration. If you listen to Commander David Fraber when he talks about going from, you know, seeing the, the Tic Tac and then cutting across and it immediately disappears and goes back to their capsite. So that also denotes intelligence. And it's showing that, hey, I know more about what you guys are doing than anybody else. Those capsites are something that only the pilots know about. And that's after they take off. How did this thing know where it was? Not on top of that, but they have hypersonic velocity. It, I mean, their ability to reach speeds of well over 3,700 miles per hour at any given time. And they can do it within the blink of an eye. Their low observability, which is what you were just talking about earlier in the show, were how come we can't get pictures of it? There's a few reasons for it. And I mean, some of it they can't even find on radar. Sometimes they do it. And number five is their transmedium travel. The ability to move through space, air, and water is just something that we don't have the ability to replicate as far as we know. And I think just those five things alone, when you look at it from a military standpoint, you're kind of at a loss because what do you do with something, A, you can't shoot and has all of these properties? That's got to be pretty scary. It might be something that is, to them, a threat to our safety, you know, national security. But what do you do about it? And, of course, they don't know what to do about it. And they're kind of keeping that close to the chest. And they're keeping their mouths shut about it because they're just as confused as everybody else. All right. Final story tonight by our good friend Christopher Sharp about Pandora's box potentially opening as Congress in the United States searches for UFO answers. This is something that I have been speaking about for a long time. Now, I know Christopher has maybe a little bit more uh, of a different approach than I do, but nonetheless, this is something we got to watch. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you have two different sides that are taking shape right now with the the NDAA and the IAA. For anybody that doesn't know what that is, that's National Defense Author Authorization Act and the Intelligence Authorization Act. And so what's going on with these is there you have the UAP task force, which was established by the IAA, uh, the Navy's UAP task force, and then the NDAA established the Oh, gosh, what is that acronym? A-A-O-I-M-S-G. Oh, my gosh. I hope I didn't butcher that. That is the worst acronym I've ever heard in my life. Their biggest thing is, I mean, once you're going transmedium, just like we've been talking about before, you know, there's they want oversight committees. And then you have people in the Senate that are they're watching all this stuff coming out and they're kind of getting bored about it. And they want more. They want more to come out They're they want to see what's going on. They want, oh gosh, there's so much to this story. It's crazy. I'm just going to go all over the place in it. But they're, and they're also going to be changing a, a, the name of it. Ho hopefully they don't. We went from UFO to UAP, and then they're trying to settle on not the Astro one, the UTP, which is unidentified transmedian phenomenon. And that's, that's basically on the table now. But renaming UAP is another way of Congress can push back against some of the obstructions within the Pentagon. And well, it's going to be interesting to see what happens because the Pandora's box just shouldn't be about technology. It mm -hmm. needs to be about everything. It needs to be about Phoenix. It needs to be about Roswell. It needs to be about Area 51, Bob Lazar, President Eisenhower. It needs to be about everything. 
you know, the astronauts and NASA playing the idiot game that they are with the public. All right. And that one still just irks me. I just, I cannot get over that. Cannot get over that. But that's just the way it is. The yeah. Pandora's box has to open. And I think, Grant, and correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of these Congress people, even the ones who are silent on this within the media, are really starting to open up their eyes of how much the wool has been pulled over over the last 70 years. It has. It, it really has. And they're they're kind of getting a little bit upset about it, and they're wanting more. They want more transparency. They want a reforming of the de declassifications that are happening. They want to be able to just get it out there. They, they believe, and they want to know just as much as we do. I mean, there was even oh, what, Scott Bray um, did a security classification classification guide, but I mean, some people say that didn't help matters. It's just one of those deals where you know, even Lou Elizondo, He's he's trying to fight for the footage, and there's a lot better. He's also said there's a lot better footage out there that is more clear and and provocative than what we're seeing as you know civilians, and they need to be let out. And even Congress is kind of fighting about that. They're like, hey, we want to see this. All right, one final story for tonight. It is World UFO Day, and. The Brits claim they spotted a UFO on UFO Day. Tell us about it. So I just want to preface this by saying this research was committed by Beavertown Brewery to celebrate World UFO Day, which falls on July 2nd, by the way. Anybody just wondering. So they actually did a poll of 2,000 adults. And this is where I'm going to have to actually, I had to write it all down. Or actually, I'm just looking at it because I cannot remember all these numbers. But they found that 37% believe that they've witnessed something out of the ordinary, quote unquote, although 35% put it down to an optical illusion. This is where you get the fuzzy pictures and the, the vibrational effects. 45% admit that they have thought UFOs and aliens existed for as long as they can remember. 23% <laughs> describe themselves as true believers of extraterrestrial life, and I am one of those. A third say that they want to believe that there are aliens, alien beings out there not being fully confident in the myth and theory. And I mean, it just keeps going on and on. You have documentaries, which are 32% of people. This is where a lot of people are getting their, their substance from. So you have 30% documentaries, 24% are reading online materials, 22% are friends and family, which I happen to be in all three of those. Over four in 10, which is, you know, 43% are alien enthusiasts because they would like to think that there's um, more beyond what we know, while 21% says that they've always grown up to believe. A third actively go out looking for unusual sightings, and 33% have even come up with their own stories about these unexplainable things. I am probably 1% in every single one of those, except for the non-believing side, because I literally actively go out every night and look at the skies and wait and see if I can find something with my cell phone in my hand. I just want a better camera, like one of those P900 cannons or whatever they are. <laughs> Don't blame you. Don't blame you. All right. Thank you, Grant, for a great UFO report. Filling in for Tim Senor, we are heading now to Shirky Poo's News. What time is it? It's time for Shirky Poo's News. All right, let's get right to it. The Lake District is one of the most picturesque parts of the United Kingdom. And... But under one of these serene bodies of water, there's an ominous creature lurking. Of course, there's a long history of people banging on about mysterious, unverifiable underwater beasts. But this time, it seems to be a little bit different. Numerous people have been reporting geese getting dragged from the surface and into the depths. Christian Grammer, who has been skippering boats in Alts water for decades, says he's never seen anything like it. Speaking on BBC Breakfast, he recalled these geese were sort of flapping their way across the water, and one of them just disappeared. We all three of us, my two crew and I saw it. We all looked at each other and say, did you see that? Looking back 
And then another one went missing 10, 20 seconds later. There was no disturbance in the water. I've never seen anything like it. In all my time, Wayne Owens sounded the alarm on social media, warning people not to let their dogs in the water. Indeed, he's going to be keeping out too. The 61-year-old wrote, Beware on Ulster Ulster's water today. I've seen a full-size goose taken off the top of the water and dragged underneath. I will work on the lake uh, this uh, was witnessed by a person working on a boat with me. This is now uh, at Howtown 2 or 2nd 1. I've seen not a joke. Oh, that's horrible, horrible grammar. But nonetheless, I think it's a catfish. I do think it's a catfish. A man in Chile has legged it after he was accidentally paid 286 times his normal salary. The banking bungle occurred in May with the man promising his boss that he would return what was overpaid to him. But instead, he quit and vanished. Yeah, let's be real here. Most people would probably do the same thing. The company accidentally paid him around 165398 or pardon me, 165,398,851 Chilean pesos instead of his usual salary of 500,000 pesos. For those playing at home, that's about $260,000 American. Yeah, he normally gets paid about 790 bucks for a month's work. So you can only assume that he is now doing a Scrooge McDuck and swimming in a pool filled of money and gold. According to the Chinese financial news website, Diario Financiero, the man worked at Corsico Industrial de Elementos, a company that is one of the largest producers of cold-cut meats in Chile. When Human Resources noticed the major banking error, CL reached out to their employee to discuss the mistaken payment. He said, yeah, here's the middle finger. I'm out. I'm taking your money and not paying it back. And one of the greatest competitions is happening in Australia right now. Yeah, Australian culture is re-glorifying the mullet. Oh, have I waited for this day. It's a real fashion and personality statement and revered in all corners of the country. There probably isn't anyone who loves a mullet more than the people at Mullet Fest who for the first time ever will be holding an online mullet competition. Mullet Fest is an annual event held in Curry Curry that honors the very best of the business of the front party in the back style. First established in 2018, it's been going strong for five years. We must bring this to North America, people. We must bring this to North America. This is our future. Mullet Fest, North America. I want a piece of this. That is your Shirky Poo's news. Thank you to Shirky Poo for putting it together. Grant for bringing us the UFO report. Swamp Dweller for another amazing spooky story. And, of course, our Keith Andrews and all the audience participation that went on to a great ET connection. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio. Rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms tonight. YouTube, Twitch, LGAP, Facebook, the Space Travelers Club, and on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Remember, this show is copyright by Space Down Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us because together, my friends, we're watching. We own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night.
We done. Heck yeah. We done. Uh, we done. We done. We done. Oh God. I can take my glasses off now. Thanks. Oh, oh that was a good one. Good night, Suzanne. Oh. There we go. Mullet and power stash. Oh, hell yeah. That is a powerful, lethal combo. Lethal. I'd do it. Heck yeah. You totally should. You totally should. <laughs> Your wife's totally going to hate you, but that's okay. Well, I still owe you a uh, crown haircut, so... <laughs> Oh my goodness, what a day, what a day. No kidding. Oh, I got I got some good stories today. You, I sh I showed you a picture of the bike I got back, right? Yeah, you got a crotch rocket. Uh, it's more of a sport touring. I mean, it looks like one, but you're sitting up right. That's I'm just <coughs> You what? I'm just coughing. Oh. Bowl haircuts are the best. Oh. Haircuts. I'm going to see if I can find a haircut tomorrow in my town. I got a better chance of winning the lottery than that happening. <laughs> I cut my own hair, to be honest. Yeah, it looks awesome. You look like you have a pompadour. <laughs> That's all because of dirty filth. Don't blame me. <laughs> what are you going to do when you have 10 pounds of paydays show up at your doorstep? Is that oh, gosh, American pounds or Canadian pounds? <laughs> um, American, my friend. I, you know, the one thing, and I'm going to say this, and I know if anybody's a mechanic out there, do not kill me for this. I was a mechanic for 17 years. I know what I'm talking about. The metric system is realistically the only way to go when it comes to bolts. I really hate a couple different things. A, and don't get me wrong, I do, I do have a an affinity towards certain brands, but when it comes to Dodge, gosh darn it. Pick one. Don't do metric and standard everywhere on your truck. It it, it just it, it's horrible. I hate it. Just don't do it. And standard is one of those things where you know if you're hey I need a fourteen. Oh well, I have is a nine sixteen. Send it. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's, I need a three eight. Well, ten millimeter work. Yes, it's just slightly bigger. Just send it. I I. Mm. I have way too many tools because of that. It stinks. Someone wants to see a picture of the bike, that's so all, I'm going to pull it up. That's all Chinese to me, man. I don't, I don't know any of that stuff. Like, I go to my dad's house, and I got to help him with, like, mechanic stuff. He's, like, always fixing things or, like, whatever. Look at that. Hey, you know what? That's, like, the Akira bike. Oh, I'm man. I'm okay with I that. Wish. So this is a 99 VFR 800 that I used to own. And I had stupidly sold it. And I literally watched that bike go from person to person to person. And each person would try to sell it on the internet for more and more and more. And I would contact every one of them. I want my bike back. One guy was a complete ass. I mean, he just, gosh, that guy, I mean, he even blocked me. He was just, he was so bad. And I said, hey, man, I know that bike's still in my name. So, I mean, if you just sell it to me, you don't even have to deal with DMV. Like, I, I can handle it. And he took that offensive. And I said, okay. So, it finally came down to this guy named Liam. Really nice cat. And I had a car. He needed a car because I think he's having a family is what's going on. So, I had a four-door Accord that I had picked up for $500 a long time ago. Since got my money out of it. And he literally came up today he actually drove two and a half hours on that bike and we shoved an extra engine in the back seat of this car and i gave him everything i had for it i had probably another i don't know fifteen hundred dollars worth of stuff that went with the car 
that all of it was already paid for. I got it back for free. And so he happily traded me pink slips and I got my bike back and here it sits in my house again. And I'm pretty happy about getting it. And it is not a 1000. It is a 99 VFR 800 interceptor. Uh, top speed right now is 158, I believe. If anybody's wondering, I have only taken it to 90 once, and that was getting on I-5 and trying to pass a semi-truck at the same time. Mm, that's a pretty easy way to turn yourself into ground beef, I can tell you that much. Uh, it, well, it depends. When you're when you're riding a motorcycle, you have to just be ultra aware of your surroundings. That's That's realistically, you have to ride and drive for everybody else. The unfortunate thing about Oregon is they do not allow lane splitting. Now, I know a lot of people in California complain about lane splitting, but if you look at it from a motorcyclist point of view, A, it's easier for us to go through cars instead of stopping at a stoplight and have a car rear end us. If a car rear ends somebody on a motorcycle, it does not end out well. So if a motorcycle has the ability to split lanes and go between cars, they're also faster off the launch unless you have one guy in a Subaru that's trying to show off and then he wants to, and that's when a motorcycle will literally just get out of his way. We don't have time for that kind of nonsense. It is something that you have to be, you can't even be tired. If you want to ride and you're tired, don't do it. Just take a car. It's you, you got to have a lot of respect for him. But at the same time, once you get used to doing it, you understand what position you want to be in in a lane. You don't want to be driving by a whole bunch of parked cars and being on the right hand side of the lane or position three because somebody can open a door and that that can hurt really bad. So there's there's a lot to it. But when, once you get used to it over time, it's it's actually great fun and it's 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 pretty exhilarating. It's, it's a freedom that I, I thoroughly enjoy. I can't ride motorbikes. Why not? I have a bad equilibrium. Oh, yeah, that'll do it. Yeah, like, dude, I could be, uh, I could be walking down and all, like, anywhere, and all of a sudden, I'll bump into things because I, I, I don't even realize that I've moved on over. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like if if I ever had, if I ever ever had to take a, a drunk test, I'd fail it because. My balance is terrible. Um, it's it's funny because when I was in children's hospital as kids and I told my doctor that I could throw a ball and catch a ball and I could skate and ride a, a pedal bike, he was blown away because I shouldn't have been able to. So is that like an inner ear thing that you have? Yeah. Gotcha. My wife would probably know exactly what you got. <laughs> I saw that heavy metal music you listen to, Dave. It's a damn heavy metal. Damn heavy metal music. Your parents were right. Yeah. <laughs> heavy metal music. Unbelievable. <laughs> Dave probably wears like a leather jacket and blue jeans and you know. Phil still has his high school Mac jacket trying to look like <laughs> like Judd Nelson off of uh off of uh oh what the hell is that 80s movie called? Molly Ringwald and all them, Emilio Estevez. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Hold on. Breakfast Club. Breakfast Club, yes. Gosh, man. Oh, I got some interesting stories about that. The Breakfast Club. Dan Aykroyd's birthday. Look at that, guys. That dude can take control of a show in like five seconds flat. He is probably the most articulated person I've ever met that can once you get him on the ufo topic it's game over hey wait yeah. a minute you've met him do you have his uh, phone number no no i wish i i wish if i had his phone number dave would be talking to him on a daily basis <laughs> i met dan Aykroyd at the roxy in vancouver oh, did you get his awesome. phone number dave no i wasn't in uh, to the ufos at that time yeah oh, well you know what i'm disappointed to both of you you know, I re I'll tell you right now, man, if I could get him on the show, I would. That that man is, he's quite the personality. He's very articulated and he has a passion and it comes through anytime you listen to him talk about it. 
And then he wants to plug in his vodka, which if you're listening, Dan, I will buy one of those bottles just because I got to know what it, what vodka tastes like that's poured over crystals and diamonds. (laughs) Okay. I've tried it. it That's how I met him. Oh, man. He was slinging uh, crystal skull vodka at the Roxy in Vancouver. Yep. (laughs) He's into that, man. Oh, yeah. I would totally slug vodka with Dan Aykroyd and plug my comic book to him. Oh my goodness. Race fan had a CBR 929RR. I rode one of those once. That is a bike not for beginners. <laughs> that bike is amazingly fun to ride. Not on the streets though. It doesn't it they they lack a little bit on the lower end, but once you hit about eight, nine thousand, man, that thing just rockets. Ugh. Eight, nine thousand miles an hour? Eight nine thousand RPM. That's oh, that's what it really would be better. Yeah. No, I will never tell anybody how fast I've been on a motorcycle. I could tell you how fast I've been in a car, but not in a motorcycle. What's what's your top in a car? A uh, one oh nine. Uh mine was hold on. Uh convert kilometers to miles. Um, 162.799. Wow. What the world were you in? Uh, 2017 Corvette ZX6. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a funny story. So I really hope I don't get in trouble for this. <laughs> for, for our Canadian uh, people or people in metric, that's 262 kilometers an hour. <laughs> That's awesome. never, I have never gripped a a a car so tightly. There is no way that if we would have crashed, that door would have ever come off, man. I had it. You know what? <laughs> Dave, oh I can just picture it. Six things. Right slam shut so hard that it just ripped a hole in the back of his pants. Oh my gosh! I will tell you my one story and. I had, and Dave, you know, yep. Okay. I'll tell it anyways. So I had, I I worked for General Motors and in working for General Motors, we sold Cadillac, Buick and GMC. We did not sell Chevrolet or anything else. And it was after Pontiac and Oldsmobile and all that. Yes, Nicholas, only 109. And I'll explain that later. But anyways, Big Mac 109. (laughs) We, uh, we got a very interesting car in the lot and it was a ct ct it was a v it was i want to say it was a ct6 yeah it was but it was a v model so it had like you know 500 horsepower and my my the business manager, which is also the finance manager, decided, and he's one of my really good friends, I will not say his name, decided, hey, let's let's take this car out for a drive. And I said, okay, that'd be fun. So we jump in and I'm driving. And so I get on the interstate and I'm I'm not messing with, this is not my car. You know, when you're talking high five figures for a car, you don't really mess around in them too much. And it literally, it was a CT6 and it was a v and we went to a street that is really fun to drive it's very short it's only about a mile and a half but it is very twisty and i went down it and i wasn't really trying to you know or actually i stopped before it and that's when i let my buddy drive and he pushed that car pretty good and he got to i mean these are we're talking about 25 30 mile an hour corners he got it up to about 60. Now, the fastest I've ever been on that road was was 65 miles an hour. And that was on a test drive with an older gentleman driving another one of the, the Cadillacs that we had. and But he was also a race car driver. So it didn't bother me that he was going as fast as he was on this road. And in fact, I, I was really one of the only... You know, salesmen on the lot that would let people pretty much do whatever they want. They really didn't scare me. So then we stop after we got to the end of this road and he's like, Hey, you want to try it? And I was like, okay, this is the business manager telling me that I can push this car. And I said, okay. So I get in 
I wanted to see exactly what I could do, but I was a little afraid of hitting a turkey or something because they're everywhere out there. And so I decided I was going to push it, and I went to 75 miles an hour on this road. And by the time we were done, and now I'm not trying to pat my own back. I'm not a race car driver, but I do know how to, how to handle a car uh, for the most part. Now, there's race car drivers out there that would just blow me away. And can I drift? No, I cannot. In a golf cart and dirt, I can. But by the time we were done, he looked over at me from the passenger seat and he says, is your, did, did I pucker your butt as much as you just puckered mine? I said, not at all. He's like, dude. <laughs> and the next day I sold it to a, a sheriff friend that I had that works there or where I used to live. And nobody ever knew. We, we actually ended up putting new tires on it before we sold it, thank goodness. But <laughs> that was the only time I've ever taken a vehicle and just said, all right, you know, it's not mine. And it's very expensive and super powerful. And yeah, might as well take advantage of it. Let's go. <laughs> oh, gosh, I probably could have been fired for that. But I don't work for them anymore. So I guess I can tell the story. Mm. And the reason why I only did 109 in a car. So this is actually a good story. The reason why I've never gone too fast in the cars, because most vehicles I have have always been over 40 or 50 years old. I, I drive a lot of classics. I don't drive like hot rods with big engines. I have, but I, I always respect them. If you ever wreck in something that old, you're most likely going to not make it through it. They're They're super... Like they're built like tanks and everybody says, oh, you're getting a wreck in this and, you know, you'll just go through a brick wall, which is true, except those bricks can come through the windshield and they're not really safe. So I always tend to not go too fast. And the only car that I did top out on, it was speed limited to 190 or 109. And that was as fast as it would go. And I only did it for a few seconds. I was never one of those guys that, you know, I have kids and everything else. So I was never one of those guys that would just jump in the car and just say, okay, let's do triple digits today. It's even when I owned very fast cars myself, I never actually pushed them. You know, I'm, I'm more of a, if I'm going to do something like that, I'm going to go to the track. You know, there's been three times in my life. And the story I just told was one of them that I did something that wasn't really smart. Uh, the fastest I've ever been was actually on a motorcycle and that was down in California and I was very young and dumb. I did make it through it, but I just, I'm just not a speed freak. Do do. You know, I must admit, Dave, that your shirt really looks like the speech from that movie where the pods came down, Arrival. You know how they did the ink speech and it was in a circle? That's kind of what your shirt yeah. looks like. I got this from David Weatherly. Oh. I was wondering about that. That's exact. I was thinking the same thing. And I was like, <laughs> bloody hell. Miss Phil and I, we watched that uh, together when it first came out. I thought that was one of the coolest things because... When they finally figure out the language was in a circle and it was like the word was that circle I, that was brilliant great writing on that one somebody mm -hmm. send that man a ham you know I, I actually did a a weekend you know the after hours on that movie and it wasn't really on that movie i just happened to use that movie as a a subject point whereas what do you do and how do we know in fact i've talked about this a couple times like if an alien species comes down and they're just like or whatever they're doing, whether it's, you know, psychic or verbal or clicks or whatever, you know, how do you actually know how to communicate with these things? Or can you, uh, there was actually something I was listening to the other day on an actual podcast. I want to believe, I, I want to say it was earth ancients and they were saying like, Hey, you know, they might not even know numbers like we know them. They they might think completely differently. So if you show them binary code, they probably won't even know what that is. 
they just see all these ones and zeros and they're like what the heck is that they might have a completely different viewpoint of how that works and it's it's a very interesting film and it's it's one that i i enjoyed watching when i first watched it if i may you may if 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 i'd be so bold some creatures and whatever from different worlds or whatever obviously if they're good enough to travel the star systems they'd probably already have the idea of okay we're gonna have difficulties dealing with these guys when we get there they may have these words numbers music even or morse code or something they're probably a little more advanced than us so they they might have that communication barrier dealt with at least a little bit but i'm not saying like all aliens or whatever are the same anyways i'm rambling but that's just kind of my opinion you know you could be right like superman when you know oh, what's the the man of steel when zod comes down and he's making a speech saying hey he's been among you i'm looking for call l and but when it's being broadcast out it's being broadcast in every single language and what if so if they're smart enough to come here or let's say they're coming through a porthole and everything's different and they're just like oh whoa dude wait a minute they're smart enough to get through a porthole but then they look at us like what in the world is this rambling stuff they're talking that's so slow whereas dolphins can tell a whole book in three clicks and a fart <laughs> yeah the dolphin thing that was the other day there and then i started looking to it and it's it's just strange it's just like the uh octopus or the jellyfish or whatever They're like oh jellyfish are like some kind of weird creature that shouldn't even be on earth type thing i don't have any like sources to cite that it was just some stuff that I was thinking about yeah, realistically, they don't even have brains, so <laughs> it's just interesting stuff, man. And I, yeah, it, it's really funny you talk about octopus because octopus are actually very intelligent creatures, and they can do. They don't mimic; they're not mimickers. But you give them a jar, and they want something that's in that jar. They figure out how to open that jar and get the whatever they want out of it. So it's one of those deals where, like, they're so intelligent that my wife actually quit eating octopus when we have go out for sushi night and stuff. She refuses to do it. She feels bad for him. Well, I'm never gonna give up. I'm never gonna give up my curry squid, man. I'll eat curry squid till the mutant cows come home. Me and you both, man. Holy smokes! Now you're making me hungry. Well, I'm always starving. Let's have a recap of this great drawing that I did. Look at that sucker. Yes. So is that me holding a beer? I mean, just asking. I guess if you're uh you're not like 17 feet tall. Yeah. You know, if I put the right boots on, maybe I don't know. Actually, you know what's funny is buddy of my work, he's a big wrestling fan, and so I made him a like a piece of cardboard I had and like cut him up and I made like a, a fake wrestling belt. And uh I was like <laughs> ray beardley heavyweight championship and the guy's like scrawny as all hells and he looks like one of the zz top brothers so i made it for him and on fridays he likes to wear it around and stuff it's hilarious <laughs> uh, oh my goodness oh i i gotta tell you guys and i i you know there's i i i think we had a conversation you know try to you know when i go out and about i talk to a lot of people i do wear you know, either you something that happens to do with UFOs or aliens. Most of the time it's Sasquatch. And I happen to be wearing both the shirt and a hat that had Sasquatch on it. This is a couple of days ago. And this gal's like, and she didn't even notice it at first. And I said, well, I got to get out of here. I got a show to do. And and she's like, a show? And I, I told her, I said, yeah, you know, I, I'm one of the co-hosts on Spaced Out Radio After Hours. And she's like, well, what is that? And I just pointed at my shirt and she's like, Oh, do I got a story for you? And then she pulls out her phone. And this gal listens to everything but us. I mean, she is deep in it. And I'm like, how did you not find Space Out Radio? And she's like, I need to find it right now. And she gives me her phone and says, subscribe to it. And so I, I find us. 
and I subscribed to it for her. And then she's like, wait a minute, because she's scrolling through it. She goes like, who's who's the who's the guy with the hair? And I and I look and I say, oh, that's Dave. He, he's he's our he's basically our everything he's he's the guy that created it he's the he's our boss he's he's just this real chill dude and she's like but he's talking to lou elizondo and i'm like well well yeah and she's like i need to listen to every one of them i mean she just went berserk it was amazing and i guarantee you right now she's probably binge watching every single one of your shows she was awesome did she like the air that's all that matters. That's what she did. She's like, who's the guy with the hair? And I, oh, that's, yeah, that's Dave. And they, I told her who you were. And I was like, oh, that's Dave Scott. And she's like, okay. Okay. I said, and he's, you know, he's, he's a really cool dude. I'm, you know, I met him down in Vegas. And she's like, you go to Vegas? I'm like, yeah, you want to go next year? And she's like, when is it? And I said, I just watch the shows. And once we get closer to it, you'll, you know, it'll all start popping up. We'll get closer to the dates and we'll start setting everything in stone. Okay. <laughs> she's, she was so animated. I mean, she's listened to Jimmy church forever and she listens to, Oh my gosh. It was actually surprising. Some of the things she did listen to. Oh, what's his name? The guy with the voice. I, I never can listen to him because he has, I guess I'm ADHD so I get stuck when I focus on something and he has this super professional, like he could, he could literally talk about Mars and you would listen to it. And he's super energetic. Gosh, darn it. What is his name, Dave? John B. Wells. No, the Graylian report. Oh, Micah Hanks. Micah Hanks. She's got him on there. I mean, all these people and she's not watching us. I was like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Like, I know you've heard about us. I do that every time I go places. Like, oh, well, how's your day? Good. What are you doing later on? Oh, I'm going to go home draw cartoons. Oh, you draw cartoons? Yep. yep. I used to radio. Da, da, da. I got little cards that are ready to handy out to people and everything. I'm like, check out my website. Check out uh, Space the Radio. It's all about aliens and Sasquatch and everything. And when I mention that, a lot of people are like, you know, one time I was out camping and like I go camping a lot and they always tell you their story or they say like, Oh, I seen some lights or something. I'm like, ah, you're not alone. And it's really weird. A lot of people are, they're willing to talk about this now, just like random people you meet. Maybe it's just me, but they might be humoring me, but you know, you say like, Hey, I draw cartoons for a show about UFOs and aliens. And they go, oh, I seen, I seen a UFO before people think I'm crazy. I'm like, well, might not be so i got a question restore belief with nikki says a few months ago when i checked sor was in the number six spot for shows where did you see that i would like to know who i'll be right back yeah where did you see that there you go i just posted it up I, am i allowed to do that oh yeah you can sorry do that. okay Hold on. Let's say hello to a few people here. Denny Lee Bailey, Tyler Howell Outdoors. Uh, who else came in late? Pinzer Flactum. Uh, the Scowling Greg O'Brien. That's awesome. Um, Diesel Girl, if she's still here. Uh, was that on the talk stream live? Might be on talk stream live. Uh, he says before he'd looked that we were in number 11th spot and that he's, he's trying to remember now. Jeez. She, let's see here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Evan Walters. I think that Stitch Organism Forty Six B. I think that Stitch from Lilo and Stitch. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Uh, yeah, it's Talk Stream Live. Uh, Paranormal Thirteen. Um, we were rated eleventh last year. And let's see here. Uh, yeah, we were rated 11th in 2021. But I never trust their statistics. Oh, my gosh. I hope the aliens land on DeGrasse's front lawn. That would be epic, actually. I mean, what what would he do then? Yeah, the one thing about Neil deGrasse Tyson. So let's let's just let me put this in perspective for you. The guy, when he goes in front of camera, actually does his homework, and it, it, he's kind of anal about it. He he gets OCD, which is fine. But then when he gets on there, and, and the his ability to just kind of thwart anything that has to do with extraterrestrials is i it, it's it's entertaining i like listening to the guy and he's actually smart so I, it's one of those deals where i can't knock him and you know, not everybody's gonna believe in it and he's just one of the nuts and bolts guys that just he has to have that alien land on his lawn in order for him to believe it i don't know don't know have you ever met him who? Neil deGrasse. Um, no. Never talked to him. Michio Kaku. <laughs> I just listened to him the other day. He was on another show that I was listening to, and I like the way he thinks as well. Let's see here. I hope the aliens drink beer. <laughs> I hope they don't, man. Have a good night, Kira. I'll see you in a week. That one done too? Oh, yeah, that one's done too. You got, you got. To, well, do you? You don't work weekends at all, do you? Uh usually I do, but uh, we're we got a long weekend this weekend. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. That is good. I'm taking all the kids out on the boat tomorrow. That's my nice. sole intent and purpose is to just man the oar and actually it's man the the helm. But yeah, it's going to be a a fun weekend. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, Grant, you hold on. We're going to say goodnight to everybody. Big thank you to Human Carl, Thomas, Sally, Eddie, Catfish, Terry, Marty, Eddie, again, Vaughn, and Cat Chaser for the amazing Super Chats. Great to have you all with us. I uh, hope if uh, you're Canadian, you had a great, great Canada Day. And uh, I'm, I'm going to say uh, thank you to everybody who gave us a thumbs up. Thumbs down once we hit the end. Do me a favor. Leave a comment below. Uh, it really helps with our algorithms as we grow. Much love to each and every one of you. We are out of here and good night.
Stay healthy, my friend. You too. You need bail money, give me a call. Always, Dad. Take care. <laughs> you too.